has um, taken their seats. So I'd like to formally welcome everybody to the Climate Change Impacts on Agriculture and Food Security Implications for Developing Climate Resistant Resilient Agricultural Programs event. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you all this morning. My name is Matthew Edwardson. I'll be emceeing and, and moderating the panels. Uh, I'm working with the ARC program uh, and I'm, I'm an employee at Tetra Tech, so it's, it's great to see all of you here today. Uh, what we're, we're gonna do is um, have, a, have an outstanding morning. Uh, we have a couple of panels. We're gonna have a lot of time for questions and answers. There's a lot of information in the back. Um, and I think this is gonna be a great learning experience for all of us, so I, I really welcome you and, and thank you for all taking time out of your, your busy schedules to, to join us today. Before we have our, um, our welcome introduction, I just wanted to briefly give you information about the, the two programs that are putting this event on. They're both um, funded by USAID out of the, you know, the office here in Washington. So one of the programs is the African and Latin American Resilience to Climate Change Program, known as ARC. I'll just be referring it to as ARC throughout the rest of the day because I have a hard time saying that. Um, it's a tongue twister for me. Uh, so ARC is a three-year project. It's been working in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. It ends in November of this year. And for the last three years, ARC has promoted adaptation to climate change and integration of climate change adaptation considerations into economic investments in order to support sustainable climate resilient growth. ARC is an innovative program, and it was designed to provide technical, analytical, and project assistance, as well as capacity building to improve the ability of vulnerable populations in Africa and Latin America to respond to climate change impacts such as those affecting agriculture and food security, which is the nexus of our conversation today. And over that period, ARC strengthened evidence-based approaches and local participation and decision-making processes. We're gonna to touch on those three broad thematic areas throughout the day. So in addition to ARC, we're really excited to be working with AgriLinks today. I'm sure many of you are familiar with AgriLinks. Um, they are an outstanding knowledge sharing hub working for the Bureau of Food Security, their, their primary knowledge management tool. They have an unbelievable wealth of resources available at their website, agrilinks.org. Um, this event is being um, simultaneously webcast by them. We have a huge amount of online participants and I'd, I'd like to also welcome all of you to the event. Uh, so all the information that you'll hear about today's program will be available on AgriLinks as well as on the ARC website as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Rolf Anderson. He's the director of the Global Climate Change Office at USAID. Before taking on this position, which he's had for about a year and a half, Rolf has been a dedicated foreign service officer he led the USAID environment programs in the Philippines. He was in Mali for a good period of time, and he also led the economic growth office in Armenia. Rolf is gonna to come to the stage. He's gonna provide us with a brief overview of climate change programming at USAID and frame ARC and the work that ARC has done within the broader USAID context and how it can be integrated across sectors. So Rolf, please. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here, and actually, happy, I mean, happier to have you here. Uh, it's, uh, it's so vital to have the interaction, your participation, and actually a lot of the thoughts and creativity of the NGO sector, academia, the private sector. I mean, uh, this is a new enterprise. Climate is something that we're all kind of learning by doing in an extremely challenging kind of uh, process, and so, uh, I think these types of interactions are, are very valuable for us, uh, for, for our learning. As one of my bosses, Eric Postel, often says, uh, you know, in some of the sectors that USAID works, like agriculture, you have 5,000 years of practice and experience and certainly decades and decades of, uh, of development experience. And in the climate, it's a, it's a much newer, fresher field. Um, it, it's, it's a very exciting time to be actually in Washington in this office. Uh, I picked the right time to come here, I'll have to tell you that. I, the, the, the political winds are out, at our backs. You know, Kerry has made this a major uh, emphasis of his, uh, of his uh, uh, strategy and policy, and we're seeing it pop up in all sorts of places in terms of the 
QDDR and other strategies. It was the first policy statement he put out. Um, more recently, President Obama has really used the latter part of his term to emphasize climate, and um, that's having a significant impact on USAID as well. Uh, and those political wins, I think, are, are timely with the, the negotiations coming up uh, uh, both this year and next year, and a hope for, a, for an agreement. To contextualize things a little bit, um, for USAID, we have actually been involved in climate in one realm or another for, for uh, quite a long time. I mean, we've done clean energy work since the 90s. Uh, and uh, in, in the 90s, we also did a lot of work on building the capacity to look at climate uh, around the developing world. But uh, this was really formalized uh, with the Global Climate Change Initiative starting in 2010. And then as a, re as a result of that, we also created a strategy which it was very significant for us. And it was uh, approved in 2012. It's a four-year strategy, it goes through 2016. It's, it's a very open-ended strategy because uh, it was a time where we really had to do a lot of experimentation and learning and finding out what people were doing and, and actually be fairly flexible as well, both for uh, the missions, their programs in the developing countries, which are uh, trying to figure out what they need to do in, in terms of climate. Um, so it set out how do we advance, the, the strategy said, how do we advance the consideration of climate change, both in strategic planning, program design, and, and project implementation? And it, it set out some very broad parameters for addressing climate change and development. Uh, in, in essence, the strategy has tried to promote clean and resilient growth. Uh, I like to think of it as better and smarter development. And, uh, um, <laughs> Nowadays, we're even saying it's kind of the new gender as we look at, at integrating climate through everything that we do. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But, but we were trying to, one, accelerate transition to low emissions development. You know this is in clean energy and how do we kind of have growing economies but with a lower emissions path. We were trying to increase resilience through adaptation and we were trying to strengthen our overall development outcomes through integration. So I think the, the strategy has been very robust and it's been pretty successful because it was a very flexible approach for, for different missions around the world and the programs to experiment, to try new things. And it, it was, uh, I would say, a very inclusive uh, approach. Um, and we made, as an agency, a lot of progress in terms of programming climate. Uh, you know, there was a big transition period where people were taking the work that they were doing in other fields, whether it was ag or whether it was biodiversity, and trying to figure out, okay, how do I take something that I'm already doing and add a climate lens to it, or how do I add a component? And now we've moved to a much different place where people are really putting climate at the central objective of their programs and their programming. Um, as I mentioned, this is really a, a process of learning by doing and experimentation. And, and I would emphasize that that's why the ARC program has been so important, because it's been trying to look and gather lessons and test hypotheses. And, and uh, it, 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 there, there's been a, a lot of learning about practices as a result of it. Overall, in terms of adaptation and integration programming in USAID, you know, the reason really why we're doing it is our country partners are really asking for this. And I, and I have to say, you know, I've I've lived and worked in many countries, and mo mo most recently I was covering not only the Philippines, but also 12 Pacific Islands. And uh, the impacts are really being felt on the ground. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate in the U.S., and much less so now, but uh, as you travel around the world, as many as you know, uh, there's a demand for work on adaptation and resilience, and you know, how, do we, how do we deal with these things? And mayors and governments are really struggling. Uh, what do I do first? How do I do it? How do I make an assessment? You know, is it worth the cost-benefit? These are very challenging questions uh, and, and big costs, big risks for governments as well. So these types of programs are super important. I mean, when you look at the Pacific, for example, king tides are swamping atolls, uh, uh, salination, their water supplies are being uh, uh, salinated. Uh, they're having a, a variety of other types of effects in terms of their agriculture. I was in Ethiopia last uh, spring, and, and there were changing rainfall patterns were affecting agriculture and having significant impacts on some of their most uh, productive uh, agriculture programs. They had to change the things that they were growing and it was affecting their, their incomes. 
And in Asia, storms have had a, and flooding have had a tremendous economic impact. You just have to look at the Philippines, where in 2009, 2.8% uh, of GDP was lost in one storm. And Thailand, where uh, economic uh, processes because of flooding were, were stalled and people couldn't move goods. Um, the bottom line is it's, it's about really serious economic effects. And I think that's a major overall transition that's occurring um, globally, but certainly in terms of our thinking. It's not just an environment problem. It's an economic problem. And, uh, and, and as a result, we're seeing a willingness for action, and in, not only in governments, but in the private sector. And people are sort of, um, they're moving with you or without you uh, <laughs> to try to uh, make adjustments. Uh, for us, and I think for the global community, adaptation and integration have been very challenging. I mean, there are just fundamental things of, you know, what's the definition of adaptation and uh, when has it been successful? You know, you have to be transformational. Um, when is it transformational? And I think that some of the studies and reports that this program have done have uh, explored those types of questions. Um, for USAID, adaptation and integration are uh, very important because we look at it as how do we protect our development gains. You know, I mean, there's a lot of risks out there, um, whether it's conflict, uh, whether it's migration, Ebola, climate. I mean, uh, so we want to be looking at all the risks that our programs face to make sure that they aren't reversed by those impacts. More recently, um, as you're probably well aware, the president issued in September a new uh, resilience executive order at the Climate Summit. And uh, uh, this is a very significant event, I think, for the overall US government. I mean, every international program, whether it's USAID, Trade and Development, OPEC, MCC, and, and many others, have to look at their international aid programs and um, see what impact that uh, screen them, see what impact climate is likely to have, and then uh, take measures to protect them, and then we have to report on them. And so this is, uh, for the next couple of years, going to be a really important transition for us as we try to kind of figure that out. We, in a lot of areas, we haven't really thought as deeply as we need to about how do we um, make our programs more resilient. So I, I think it's a fantastic time, a fantastic opportunity, and I think that that links to why the groundwork done by programs such as ARC are so important. Um, so today's important is very, uh, meeting is very important because it presents the highlights of the lessons learned from the, from the ARC program. This has been a three-year program focused on thought leadership and development of analytic techniques in climate change adaptation. Um, it's an example of how USAID is trying to push into a new area. We want to make sure to ensure that our strategic de de uh, de decisions about climate change investments, uh, as well as addressing the climate change risk inherent in uh, our sectoral investments, are based on the best available evidence. Um, this has been a this is a major issue that I see out in the field. Is you know people just don't have the data for good de sound decision making. Um, and at the time that ARC was started, a lot of the vulnerability assessments in the Africa region were focused more on perceptions of climate change and general conclusions rather than uh, real evidence. And there was uh, very little work that, that was being done on climate change's expected impacts or actionable recommendations. And you know, your partners in the field really are looking for stuff don't confuse me. Tell me what's sort of actionable that will make a difference that's important to people, sort of livelihoods or their, or, 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 or their um, communities. So and one example of this is that ARC has been focused on um, heavily on climate smart agriculture. And, and that is before CSA was att attracting as much attention as it currently is. So it was prescient. I don't know if it was lucky or smart on the, on the part of the program. But it really kind of set the stage for some of the work that's now being done in climate smart agriculture. Uh, and uh, they did, for example, vulnerability assessments in Uganda, Malawi, Senegal, and West Africa and the Sahel, all with a major focus on food security. So I think in conclusion, I just want to say that I am looking very forward to today's uh, 
panel's presentations, findings, and the overall discussions, and I want to welcome you and thank you for being here today with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolf. That was a wonderful way to, to set the tone for the discussion, and um, we appreciate your, your kind comments about, about the program. Uh, so I'd like to invite the panelists to, to come on up um, and take your seats. I'm going to quickly go through what you have in your registration packet, um, and then we'll move right on into, into the event. So. In that blue folder, uh, there's, there's four documents. Uh, we're not going to go over them all at length here. I'm just going to quickly let you know you have bios of all the speakers, so please look at those at, at your convenience. There's an overview of um, kind of the, the, the core document which ARC has produced, uh, which is a compendium of, of really how, how this whole process was undertaken and, and what we learned from it. It's a, it's a quick read. You can look at that um, and then get yourself geared up to, to read the much longer document, which, um, which we, we hope uh, you'll be able to, to look over at, at, at great length. And I just wanted to also note that you have a list of publications, which I'll talk about at the end of the day, but today we're, we're going to focus on four activities which ARC undertook, and that's really the tip of the iceberg. There's about 65 different documents, um, and they're all very thorough. They've all been peer-reviewed um, by multiple individuals, and there's been multiple rounds of editing, and, and they're, they're, there's a huge wealth of knowledge. So just bear that in mind as, as, you, as you hear what we're talking about today and then think about what we, what we have available. That's really uh, one of the things that we want to make sure everybody understands is this information has been produced, and, it, and it's out there, and there's a lot of it, and we really want to make it as accessible as possible to all of you. Um, so the, the last document you have is, is the agenda, um, and basically the, the agenda is um, all about the panel discussions. So what we're here to do today is to, to share the lessons learned from ARC, um, and especially those lessons learned that relate to agriculture and food security, and we also want to expose you to, to the documentation um, that we have on ARC. And, and what we're going to do in terms of objectives is we've broken things up into, into two panels. So the first panel, which has just taken their seats, what they're going to do um, for about the next hour and a half or so is, is talk with us about the key lessons learned from designing and implementing climate change and agriculture-based livelihood and vulnerability assessments. So we're going to each speak, and then we'll have a lively question and answer. Then we're going to do a quick change where we're going to have a, a, a brief discussion about what we've done in terms of knowledge management. There's not going to be a formal coffee break, um, so during that interchange or even throughout the day, if, if you need to get up, use the restrooms, get up some coffee, please do so at your leisure. Um, and then we're going to quickly move into the second panel where we're going to talk about, you know, how these lessons learned were taken up. What was the uptake of these lessons learned and how are they utilized? So we're going to focus on the same, you know, four countries um, yet again. So that will then be concluded with some closing remarks, and then we're going to have a, a gallery walk, and we're going to have lunch for everybody, and there's a lot of information out there that I know you've already been kind of taking in, so, you know, th there's going to be publications, and that'll all happen at about 12.30. So that's the day, um, or the morning, so to speak, and we'll wrap up around 1.30. So I'm going to move over to my seat and um, introduce the panel and, and we'll get going. All right. So we all have live mics throughout here, so we're, we've all been trained to not say anything unless we're supposed to be talking because we can't turn these off. Um, so just to quickly give you an overview of what we're going to do on these panels. As you can see, I have uh, four individuals next to me. Each of them are going to speak for about eight to ten minutes. Um, we're going to hold questions and answers till the end. Uh, there's two mics up, and we're going to have online questions as well, and that's going to run for about 25, 30 minutes. I'm going to introduce each panelist very briefly. You've got bios, as I noted earlier, so please you know, feel free to reference those. If, and um, everyone's going to be available at the end of the day for, or for an hour, so you can definitely um, you know, have, a, have a good chat with everybody at that point. So the first place we're going to go to is Uganda. And um, 
Trish Caffrey is sitting directly to my right. Um, she was the team leader for the climate change vulnerability assessment in Uganda. She's also, also the ARC chief of party. For 30 years, Trish has been working in Africa and Latin America. She's a specialist in many things, amongst them climate change, working with vulnerable populations, working on civic engagement, and doing social and environmental assessments. So Uganda was the first um, CCVA that ARC undertook, and it provided a number of important lessons for us. So Trish, please um, share those with us. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to see so many people in the room. And um, I get to start out with the first assessment that ARC implemented. Um, there were a lot of lessons learned because it was the first assessment. Um, it was very important that what we engaged initially with the mission in Uganda, and they were really what we call our initial champion. The second panel will talk more about how that relationship with USAID and USAID's role as a champion evolved to include many more champions so that they could take basically the results of these findings and use them to influence program and policy. So my few minutes of uh, my talk today is I'm going to focus just really on the lessons learned related to design, implementation, and stakeholder engagement. And I'll give a very, very uh, top of the trees overview of some of the major results. Um, as I said, we worked closely with USAID, and it took us a, a bit of going back and forth to actually define the, the goal, the purpose for the assessment. Um, it was focused, really, as you see here on the overhead. Our goal was to show how current climate patterns shape and how future climate patterns may influence key crop value chains and livelihoods of households in six Feed the Future districts in Uganda that depend on them. Our analytical framework was really quite simple. We adapted the IPCC definition of vulnerability, which is a function of exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. And you can see how our three guiding questions really lead us in that direction. So in terms of exposure, we wanted to understand how will climate change impact those selected crop value chains? Sensitivity, what impacts will climate change and variability and variability have on a representative range of Ugandan rural livelihoods. And finally, in terms of adaptive capacity, how will farmers adapt in response to climate change impacts on the study crops? It was a very comprehensive and complex assessment. Here um, on the map, you can see that we focused on six Feed the Future districts. Um, it's quite a bit of um, agroecological variation. For those of you who know Uganda, the altitude varies quite a bit, and there are bodies of water. So in terms of climate and exposure and understanding that, it was really different in each of these areas, as well as the crops that were grown and the conditions. Even there were ethnic differences as well throughout the six districts. Um, I mentioned we focused on eight of the major crops that people's livelihoods depended on, and uh, six the six districts on the map. Um, it, we also, when we looked at adaptive capacity, um, it's really important that, you know, people, the farmers are the, at the household level are the ones who are adapting to these changes. So we looked at that level, community level, but also in terms of institutional capacity and ability to be able to um, build on, work with the farmers and develop adaptive capacity. We, look, we looked at the local, district, and national levels institutionally. The design, as you see here, was basically we had four analytical components. We had a multidisciplinary team. We had um, scientists who led up each of these teams, the climate analysis, value chain analysis, livelihoods, and the water. And our biggest challenge was really, as we, we did um, our assessment and conducted our surveys, was we had to come back together and once again work on putting all the data together to answer these guiding questions. And, and so in design, here it looks simple, but it was really quite complex, okay? Um, we needed to get accurate, useful information that integrated all of the lines of inquiry. We did a, um, we had a number of lessons in terms of the process. Um, as I said before, it was a very iterative process. We came back together frequently as a team and shared what we were learning 
At the end, we did cross-disciplinary in integration, um, putting all these data sets together and making sure that the um, sum was really not the individual parts, but the whole of those different parts. Um, stakeholder engagement was one of our biggest lessons here, to make sure that we were really um, conducting a study that would be useful and would influence change. We really, we involved, we, we engaged with stakeholders at the design phase, and that was primarily USAID, gathering information from all those different levels that I was talking about from the different groups. And also, people were very involved, the stakeholders were involved, key stakeholders, in actually validating and generating the final recommendations. So we had stakeholder engagement all along the way. We, we wanted to make sure that the Ugandans who would be in the position to address these, what we found out, would own the design and the results, okay? Um, we also incorporated local expertise and knowledge in the team, and we worked very hard at communicating out in different ways our findings. Our findings, as I said, came together to basically answer these three guiding questions. Uh, in terms of climate, we um, did projections um, from 2015 to 2045 period, and we basically found that annual mean rainfall, the average will not vary that much over time, that period. But in fact, interannual variability will be quite high. It has been high and it will continue to probably um, be a challenge for farmers. Um, increase in an interesting um, finding was that we found that there would be an increase in precipitation during what is normally the dry season, which has impacts on post-harvest drying and um, storage of grains particularly. Um, and there's a, the significant, there's been a historical trend of increase of temperature and that will continue well into the future. So that's one of the bigger challenges, increasing temperature. In terms of sensitivity, our value chain analysis and phenological analysis review show that um, Arabica coffee would really, is probably going to be the most vulnerable to climate changes. Um, currently, it needs fairly cool temperatures to grow. Um, as temperatures increase, it will probably, it will need to move up altitude. And, and there's not a lot of land in um, Uganda to do that, and it will impact on the higher forests and the highlands. Um, in terms of the least vulnerable crops of the eight that we studied, cassava was the least vulnerable. It's much more tolerant to um, increasing temperatures and, and dryness. Um, the report, as I said, gives, goes into a lot more detail. This is just at the top of the trees. Um, in terms of household vulnerability, what impact will this have at the household level and the farmers that are growing these crops? Um, people are quite, there's a system, systemic vulnerability. Everybody's dependent on these eight crops. And any change in food production will critically increases their vulnerability. Um, they have no buffers against additional stress, very little. Um, in terms of um, food insecurity, for th an average of three months over the 2011 farmer, the households were food insecure. Characteristics of the most vulnerable households, actually a very large sample of the 800 household survey was considered most vulnerable, is they have a lower proportion of able-bodied people in their household, less well-educated, um, they are less likely to sell their crops or more likely to consume them themselves, less access to loans, social capital, um, and earning off-farm income. In terms of adaptive capacity, um, income diversity was really the key in terms of being able to weather stresses. Um, their households um, with greater adaptive capacity have a, um, basically manage more diverse agriculture portfolios more crops, um, they invest in livestock, um, they also have some other sources of income that um, are not on off farm as well. Um, the farmers, we did an extensive survey of farming practices to get an indication of adaptive capacity. They're already adapting uh, practices uh, in response to climate variability. And um, we recommend that uh, future strategies build on these. Um, they were planting additional crops and crop varieties. They were investing more in livestock and, and fruit trees, modifying their management practices by shifting planting dates, preparing soil differently, and um, changing their mix of crops. Um, 
But with that said, um, they, their short-term coping strategies um, are basically to sell manual labor for rather cheaply or produce charcoal. Um, Longer-term strategies we found is basically migration and also um, educate, investing in the education of their children. Um, I will, the, the second panel, my colleague Rita Lakar Ojak will be presenting, um, in fact, the, the results of the study, what the uptake was, and how that's influenced policy and programs since then. Since then, I now pass over to David Miller. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Much appreciated. Thanks for, for kicking things off. And, you know, as it's just definitely the tip of the iceberg. There's a, there's a lot more, and we look forward to Rita talking about the uptake in, in the second panel. So we're going to shift sides on the African continent and go over to Senegal now. Um, so David Miller um, works with ACDI VOCA. He's also the technical advisor for Africa um, on the ARC program. And he led the Senegal um, CCVA. Uh, I'm not going to say climate change vulnerability assessment anymore. I'm just going to abbreviate with CCVA <laughs> um, because I see we're already running a few minutes behind schedule on a safe time. <laughs> so David's been working um, for about 30 years um, contributing to sustainable climate change, environment, ag development strategies, and practices. He's been a lead technical expert on numerous USAID and other donor-funded programs on food security and livelihoods. Um, and he's been working on climate change vulnerability and adaptation, you know, globally for, for a long, long time. The Senegal presentation is, is going to talk about how the team collaborated to reduce uncertainty. Um, and it, it's a wonderful um, eight to ten minute discussion we're about to have. So, David, please. Thank you, Matthew. Um, everybody, I'm going to start with a little bit of advice. When you listen to my presentation, think of it as sort of a movie trailer, okay? It's meant to tintillate and suggest a much larger product, and also don't expect too much of a plot. <laughs> As it turns out, predicting the future is not easy. Uncertainty is a significant challenge in all stages of human systems and change. This isn't any different for climate change vulnerability assessments, in which we're trying to understand how to prepare people, us, for the climate change impacts in the future. Not only is there uncertainty in climate change projections, but there's certainly uncertainty in how people are going to respond to changes in climate, as well as uncertainty in how the larger context is going to change. Our markets are going to change independently of climate, national policy. Um, in the Senegal assessment, we piloted a quantitative approach to conducting a vulnerability assessment and exploring climate change vulnerability. I'm going to describe some strategies we used to enrich the results uh, that we produced and reduce uncertainty around those results by integrating our design as well as relying on the active collaboration of the team members. First let me introduce the assessment. Eastern Senegal People in this region of Senegal practice primarily agro-pastoral livelihoods. However, in the more arid north, the lighter blue area, uh, there is a greater predominance of people practicing uh, herding livestock ownership uh, as opposed to the more humid south. Um, the objective of our study was to look at the, to compare the vulnerability of people practicing different livelihoods. Um, we looked at livestock dependent households, mixed system households where the balance between cropping and livestock holding was a little more balanced, and crop dominant households. Um, to do this, we developed a new approach in which we created indexes from the crop modeling, biomass modeling, and household survey results so that we could quantify these three components of vulnerability that Trish just mentioned, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And then we used qualitative measures, qualitative methods, to enrich those results and, and, and provide some grounding for them. We had focus groups, interviews with experts, key informants, as well as a number of literature reviews. 
And we needed all these various complicated parts to fit together and make sure that everyone was pulling in the same direction. So we spent a lot of time working with the extended team, actually creating the definitions that we were going to be using for exposure sensitivity, adaptive capacity, designing the various products. Um, so the whole, all the pieces would contribute to the whole. This is just, uh, don't try and read those charts. Uh, it's just to give you an idea of the, uh, a, a look at the range of different quantitative results that we produce, as well as on your right-hand side there, some of the institutions who were involved, involved in the assessment. It was a um, complex, uh, challenging coordination. And because we were uh, piloting a new approach, we used a large number of old methods that you'll be familiar with, as well as new methods, to try and ground truth and flesh out our findings. Here's sort of a motley list of some of them. In modeling, it's standard procedure to tune your software using object, uh, observed data, known, known data. We did that, of course, in our looking at our climate projections as well as our crop and biomass modeling. But we also carried this approach through into the analysis and actually into the uh, presentation of our results. And I'll provide you an example of that later on. But now you can think of it in some ways similar to how we in our focus groups identified adaptive practices that people in this region were taking and then uh, compared those, got a better understanding of those through a literature review of how people responded to climate change in the same region in the 70s and 80s. Um, in fact, the division of the study zone into two subzones was a way of helping us have a broader perspective of how people responded to climate change. Um, with the idea that uh, the households in the south are experiencing some of the climate stressors that those in the north are already experiencing, and in fact some of the climate stressors that might be uh, appear as a result of climate change, particularly uh, lower rainfall. Um, there were a few critical adaptive strategies that people in the zone take to address vulnerability. Uh, for example, uh, transhumans moving livestock around to adjust to climate diversity and, and uh, weather in different regions, and uh, how people over time use the fact that they have two different forms of income, crop farming and, and livestock raising, how they use that dynamically over time to reduce risk. We weren't able to model those relationships, but through our focus group uh, interviews in the same villages where we collected the survey study, we were actually able to um, have an idea of that, those dynamics because the focus group uh, discussions were structured in the form of agricultural case histories. So over the last 20 years, we got a sense of how people had responded to, to climate uh, using these strategies. And then finally, our two national partners who were engaged in, in the design, implementation, al analysis, and presentation of the results uh, that not only grounded our results in local experience uh, and knowledge, but also brought in a wider range of perspectives uh, influencing our, our, our results and our conclusions. So these are the uh, what I call the capstone diagrams produced by the study. And they uh, can suggest a couple other examples of how uh, in, in the Senegal assessment, we triangulated, uh, sort of used productive redundancy to flesh out and ground our results. They're the highest level conclusions of the study, um, but of course there were lots of sub-conclusions uh, that we presented um, in producing these. What they are is they're the results of our measurements of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, those indexes we created. As you see on the top, there's exposure. And on your right, sensitivity. Is that your right? Yeah, on your right, sensitivity. And then the other two, resilience deficit and asset deficit, those are measures of adaptive capacity. They're basically the resources people have or lack of resources uh, to respond to climate threats, um, climate change in the long term. Okay? Now, if you look at it, uh, the different colors represent the different livelihood types green, livestock dominant, uh, red, those mixed households and blue, the crop-dominant households. Um, on one side, it's the 
um, northern half of the study zone and the southern side. And the larger the form, the greater the vulnerability. Okay? So let's first look at the green shapes. So you'll see in the northern subzone, the shape is largest, whereas in the subzone, in the southern subzone, it's the smallest shape. Much different levels of vulnerability with the same type of livelihood strategy. Um, so in this case, to some extent, uh, vulnerability differs uh, by location. In fact, the live, the, although it's the same livelihood, it represents the two extremes of vulnerability in the study zone. And our focus group discussions uh, supported this conclusion. Livestock dominant households in the south were found to be wealthier. They un undertook fewer adaptive strategies, and in fact, there was more uh, aggressive in investment in livestock holding in the south. Now, let's look at the two groups of, uh, of uh, diagrams, the two diagrams as a whole. Um, as you notice, how in, the ge in general, in the northern subzone, the uh, vulnerability is a factor of exposure and sensitivity. The quadrangles are, reach more towards uh, the top and the right, whereas in the south, it's all based on uh, assets. Vulnerability is a lack of, of wealth and a great higher level of, of stress, uh, lower resilience capacity. Um, while the overall vulnerability in these two zones is roughly comparable, the causes are different. Again, other parts of the study helped us make sense of this. In focus group interviews, survey results, and a, actual, an additional GIS mapping study of access to markets and, and road works, roadways, uh, it, they clearly point out that in the southern zone, uh, it's much more isolated, fewer public services. So uh, vulnerability is not simply a function of climate, exposure to climate, but also capacity to respond to those threats. In these diagrams, we also see a way in which we improved our understanding of our finding concerning future vulnerability by relating them to known experiences. These diagrams you're looking at now are based on historical changes in climate, actually between a 20-year period of uh, 1990s to the, and the aughts compared to the 70s and 80s. Uh, in the assessment itself, we present these diagrams next to a similar pair of uh, diagrams, but in which we used the climate projections to 2050. In fact, the two sets of diagrams don't differ all that much, and the projections indicate that climate conditions, as well as the model pro productivity of pasture and crops, won't differ that much uh, from the changes between now, basically, and the 70s and 80s. Okay? So by presenting our analysis in the context of hi historical change, we not only increase the sense of legitimacy of our results, uh, but also helped ourselves and the consumers of our assessment better visualize what the conditions might be in the future, um, how to prepare for them. Thank you. Great. Thank you much, David. Um, I, I personally think there was a plot. So <laughs> congratulations. Nice work. Very complicated. Um, so we're going to now um, shift shift over to Western Honduras. Um, and Western Honduras is going to be presented by John Parker, who's uh, up at Tetra Tech in Burlington. He is the team leader for the Western Honduras CCVA. He's um, an associate in the environment and natural resource sector up in, up in Burlington. John's a uh, land and water resource specialist. He's been working in development um, for a little over 10 years. And he's uh, got a lot of experience managing, implementing, and, and researching multi-sectoral policy and programming strategies that strengthen the resilience of social and ecological systems. And it's this lens of social and ecological systems that um, was applied to the Western Honduras um, assessment. And John, uh, please uh, take us through that process. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so this was a, a multidisciplinary study. Uh, the purpose was to examine the impact of climate change and climate variability on ecosystems and livelihoods uh, in the dry corridor region of, of Honduras. Uh, 
as Matthew mentioned, the, the ecosystem's perspective is uh, perhaps the unique element of the study uh, and what differentiates it from uh, some of the other assessments that we're, we're hearing about today. The dry corridor uh, region of Honduras depicted in, in the map um, has among the highest levels of food insecurity, uh, stunting in poverty in Honduras and uh, Central America. Uh, livelihoods in the region uh, predominantly uh, depend upon agriculture, uh, principally maize and bean uh, production and also coffee production. Uh, and smallholders uh, mostly cultivate uh, very steep, uh, fragile hillside agroecosystems. It's a region that is uh, regularly afflicted by seasonal droughts and floods um, and has high natural climate var variability uh, uh, driven mainly by the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomenon. Uh, in coordination with USAID Honduras, we defined uh, three objectives for this assessment at the outset. The first was to understand uh, the historical trends and the future projections for, for climate uh, in the dry corridor. Uh, secondly, to assess how those climate projections uh, would affect ecosystems and livelihoods in the region. And third, to identify uh, existing and potential adaptive responses that could be integrated into programming. Um, through the government of Honduras, uh, USAID, as well as other uh, donors. Uh, this was a truly interdisciplinary assessment. Uh, we incorporated a wide variety of uh, distinct but interrelated analytical components. Uh, we looked at uh, climate, uh, we looked at ecosystems, uh, considering eco-hydrology, so the relationship between uh, water and ecosystems uh, and protected areas. Uh, we carried out a, a phenological analysis that looked at uh, the sensitivity of, of key crops, uh, so maize, beans, coffee, and horticultural crops, and how that might change uh, in, uh, depending upon changes in, in temperature and precipitation. Uh, we carried out a uh, value chain analysis which looked at how climate uh, might impact uh, different stages of, of key crop value chains. And we also carried out a livelihoods and institutional analysis. So to weave these various analytical components together, we developed a, a research framework uh, that uh, looked at climate change vulnerability through the lens of uh, social ecological systems. So the concept of, of social ecological systems uh, recognizes the interaction and interdependence of, of human and nature uh, and the dependence of individuals on ecosystem services for, for their livelihoods. So in, this concept is particularly relevant in the context of, of the dry corridor uh, as households critically depend on natural resources for food and livelihood security. Uh, in terms of methods, we used a, a mixed methods approach. Uh, it used uh, existing secondary data and climate, uh, hydrology, uh, land use. Uh, and we gathered primary data through key informant interviews uh, with local institutions, as well as a range of uh, focus group discussions with, with farmers. Uh, we adopted uh, analytical uh, methodologies and tools that had been previously uh, developed under other ARC assessments, uh, including the Uganda vulnerability assessment that, that Trish uh, presented on earlier. Uh, but we also developed new methodologies, and some of these were, were quite innovative. Um, we developed an eco-hydrological vulnerability index for watersheds, uh, which incorporated key uh, ecological and hydrological variables, including water production potential and permanent land cover uh, to determine the sensitivity of, of watersheds in the dry corridor pro to projected changes in temperature and precipitation. Uh, we integrated social variables into this index, uh, including poverty, uh, population density, uh, as well as the human development index uh, to create an overall uh, social ecological vulnerability index uh, for watersheds. Uh, we also developed a climate envelope uh, for ecosystems, which is displayed in, in, in this graphic here, which showed how the distribution of existing ecosystems in the dry corridor uh, would potentially change from present temperature and precipitation scenarios uh, to those projected by the IPCC for, for 2050. I'll further explain this graphic as I, I discuss some of our, our findings. So what did we find? Um, our findings overall demonstrated how uh, climate change affects ecological systems and the ecosystem services generated uh, by these systems and how this in turn uh, impacts agricultural livelihoods. And I'll provide a very high level overview of, of some of our findings. In terms of climate, uh, we found that the, the dry corridor is likely to become a hotspot of climate stress over the next 35 years. 
Uh, climate models predict that temperature will increase by between one and two and a half degrees Celsius uh, by 2050. Precipitation is projected to decrease over this time period by between 10 to 20 percent. Uh, normal years uh, will likely be similar to, to current El Nino conditions, uh, while El Nino years will likely exhibit a greater, even greater extremes of, uh, uh, in temperature and precipitation. Uh, and this will have profound effects on uh, ecosystems in the dry corridor. Uh, we can expect that overall water availability will decline. Uh, however, flood events are expected to become more intense. Uh, projected warming and drying will shift the distribution of areas suitable for species and habitats. So returning to this, the, the climate envelope uh, graphic, uh, we can see that with this shift, uh, areas suitable for cooler, moister forest types, uh, such as broadleaf forests, mixed forests, and pine forests, uh, will uh, decrease while uh, areas suitable for cloud forests, which are essential for uh, water production as well as for livelihoods, uh, could completely disappear. Uh, this would result in a shift to ecosystems more suitable for drier and warmer climates, uh, which will likely increase the area of dry forests and shrublands. In terms of key crops, uh, we found that higher temperatures and more variable precipitation would likely result in decreased productivity and an increase in the prevalence of common pests and diseases. Uh, in the case of coffee, farmers will uh, likely shift to cultivating in, in higher altitudes. And this is already, uh, this behavior is already being exhibited uh, to adapt to the impacts of coffee leaf rust. Uh, and this will likely put even greater pressure on cloud forests and, and protected areas. So how will these impacts on ecosystems affect livelihoods? As I mentioned previously, livelihoods in the dry corridor depend on natural resources. Uh, in agriculture. Uh, so the impacts of decreased crop productivity, uh, less available water, and greater pressure on scarce natural resources will have significant impacts on livelihood outcomes. Uh, and this will likely be exhibited through increased food and nutrition insecurity, uh, reduced employment opportunities as climate impacts are felt across the various stages of, of crop value chains, uh, and reduced household incomes. Um, and this will increase the potential for, for migration, uh, not only within uh, Honduras to, to urban areas, but also uh, to the U.S., uh, and which, as many of you know, is already a very serious issue uh, facing Honduras right now. Uh, so what can be done? Uh, we've, we found that a, a wide range of, of governmental, uh, civil society, uh, private sector institutions, but perhaps more importantly, farmers themselves are mobilizing uh, efforts and, and playing critical roles uh, to address climate variability and change. But we also found that the pace and scale of adaptation efforts is not meeting the challenge. Uh, Isaac Ferreira from USAID Honduras is presenting in the second panel about some of the efforts of Honduran institutions, uh, USAID, and the donor community to scale up adaptation efforts in the dry corridor. Um, and I'm just going to really quickly run through uh, our five adaptation pathways that we recommended uh, in our report uh, to build the resilience of ecosystems and livelihoods in, in the dry corridor. Uh, the first is improving the information base. Uh, and this isn't just climate information, uh, but hydrology, land use, uh, and soils. It's, it's all the information necessary for, for local decision makers uh, to make informed adaptation decisions. Uh, secondly, it's, it's absolutely essential uh, to focus efforts on building the resilience of water resources. Uh, this is both at the watershed as well as the on-farm level, and not just uh, blue water resources, but also green or, or soil moisture uh, water management. Uh, third is strengthening the management of, of the protected area system uh, and also critical ecosystems, uh, including cloud forests. Uh, fourth is livelihoods diversification, both on-farm incorporating more uh, climate resilient crops and uh, improved varieties, uh, but also looking at uh, opportunities to diversify livelihoods off farm. And fifth uh, is to build the capacity of local institutions to help shift the, the, the institutional focus uh, from disaster response to a longer term uh, vision of, of uh, risk mitigation and, and risk reduction. Thank you. Great, thank you, John, um, for those, those remarks and, and for highlighting a a different yet very appropriate approach to, to this, this level of, of an assessment. Uh, so we're going to close, close the last um, presentation on this panel before we go to questions, go back over to, to West Africa. Alex Ashurbanen from the Center for International Earth Science and Information Network at uh, Columbia University and the um, Earth Institute will, 
will be presenting. Alex is the principal author of the Mali Climate um, Change, uh, Mali Climate Vulnerability Mapping um, effort. He's a senior researcher at CSIN. Um, CSIN is an environmental data and analysis center. And Alex is a, is a geographer, and his interests are, are wide, um, but they focus primarily on the human aspects of environmental change at the local, national, and global scale. Alex's presentation is going to highlight the use of vulnerability mapping through the lens of the IPCC vulnerability framework and how this process uh, provides decision makers with alternative tools for, for decision making. So please, Alex. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so I wanted to say, first off, that this is really a measure. Uh, we measure the relative vulnerability within Mali. We know that Mali already is a highly vulnerable country. Not actually, I looked at the World Risk Index and the Climate Risk Index, and Honduras actually is slightly higher in terms of its ranking, in terms of overall vulnerability. But we know that the Sahel region in general will uh, be affected by, is already affected by periodic droughts and other things that affect its uh, vulnerability. Um, so just to start out with a little bit of background on vulnerability mapping and why it's useful. First of all, it um, basically integrates two aspects. One is the biophysical and uh, climate system aspects, the exposure, and the other is the human and economic system sensitivity. Um, basically, we use the IPCC framework, as, as did the other studies. And we looked at layers that represent exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, and each of these is spatially differentiated. Um, mapping can illuminate the key vulnerabilities within the system. Uh, so it can kind of target or show you where to, to focus your attention. While it may tell you where adaptation may be required, it will not necessarily tell you what needs to be done. And I liken vulnerability mapping to essentially a desk study. So you can sit at your computer, gather all the necessary data layers, compile them, and it will, voila, after you do some, some somewhat complicated math, come up with a vulnerability index. Uh, at the end of that, you still may need to go out to the, you still need to go out to the field basically to see what the local dynamics are uh, and find out what, the, what systems are, are most vulnerable and, and uh, how best to design interventions. Um, now, visualizing, uh, there's a number of benefits to this. One is visualizing how different uh, climate stressors may interact with different sectors and portfolios, such as agriculture and health. You can target regions for more in-depth vulnerability assessments, um, and it can start stimulating discussion within teams. So in Mali, uh, as, it, as it does in many other countries, the maps actually served as a boundary object. People could come together around the table look at the maps and begin to identify how um, um, climate impacts may, uh, in climate exposure may impact their, their given sectors. Um, before presenting the results, I wanted to say a few caveats about climate vulnerability mapping. Uh, one is that vulnerability itself is a construct. It cannot be measured directly. It's what we call an emergent property. So when you have a sensitive system and you have exposure to climate stressors, Basically, out of that comes uh, vulnerability. It emerges from those two things. What You can't observe it directly, but you can get data sets that often serve as proxies, and they can point to the construct of vulnerability, and you assemble multiple data sets into indices. In doing that, you, uh, you need good data. You need a good framework. Uh, but there are issues such as uh, compensability. So a high score on one indicator may counteract a low score on another indicator. There are other issues such as the fact that we generally assume a linear relationship between the indicators. X degrees change in temperature uh, may equal X number of percent changes in infant mortality rates. Uh, however, we can't say for sure that we know those relationships. There may be absolute thresholds beyond which, uh, say, a precipitation threshold beyond which certain types of crops can't be grown. So those are the kind of things that you have to, we make some heroic assumptions in order to produce the maps. But to do a more scientific uh, or rigorous assessment, you'd really need to know what some of those thresholds are. Um, finally, in terms of data and data availability, in many developing countries, we know that data sets are relatively sparse. Uh, there's one issue, which is that you often have out-of-date data. In Mali, there was a major conflict event in 2011. Uh, we could not capture that in our, our data sets. We had data sets generally that sort of ended around 2008 or 2009. Um, 
we um, often have low spatial resolution data. Climate data sets, for instance, can be very coarse grid cell resolution, sometimes as coarse as one half degree grid, um, grid cell size. We were very fortunate in the case of Mali that we had very high resolution data from the FuseNet project. Uh, we also had somewhat low resolution data for some uh, parameters such as infant mortality. Uh, finally, there are spatial and measurement errors. We know that there are problems with the validity and reliability of our data sets. So all of these things combine to uh, essentially increase uncertainty. Okay, by this point you're probably saying why do it at all, right? But uh, hopefully you'll see. Um, so these uh, four maps actually are, um, give you some indication of what went into um, the overall exposure uh, component. Uh, just to say at the outset that the, the map scales here, everything that's in blue is basically in the 0 to 20 index range. So that means low vulnerability. Everything that's in red is in the 80 to uh, 100 index range. That make, means basically high vulnerability. Uh, and that we use that kind of consistent mapping um, uh, uh, representation throughout. And the yellows and the, and the oranges are between those two. Um, we eliminated, uh, or rather removed, we didn't eliminate, but we removed from consideration everything north of the 17th parallel because these are areas that are very sparsely populated and which have very little economic activity. So moving from uh, clockwise from the upper left, we had data sets for exposure. These are a sample of six data sets that we had total in the exposure category for average annual total precipitation. Uh, the interannual coefficient of variation in vegetation greenness, flood frequency, and long-term trends in, in rainfall and uh, rainy season temperatures, moving in that clockwise direction. The overall, uh, what we did is we aggregated those all into one overall exposure component, and that basically shows the, the south to north gradient of declining rainfall and increasing rainfall variability. Moving to sensitivity, uh, we had a number of data sets, including uh, the demographic and health survey data on household wealth and child stunting, as well as data on things like conflict events and soil fertility. The conflict events actually did capture some of the more recent events in, in northern Mali. Uh, this component reflects high rates of malaria exposure, infant mortality, and poverty in the densely settled southeast portion of, of Mali. For adaptive capacity, we also had DHS survey data on maternal education, which has been shown to be a very strong predictor of adaptive capacity, health infrastructure, and irrigated areas. Um, this basically, the adaptive capacity component showed a sort of gradient away from Bamako as you move away from Bamako and, and get into increasingly isolated regions in the north and away from the Niger River, you find that adaptive capacity generally declines. These were all combined into an overall vulnerability index, which you see here. So out of this exercise, we learned some very important lessons. Um, one of them was that uh, these data sets, and, and Alex Apatsos will address this more in the later panel, uh, were, were very uh, heavily used by the USAID mission for programming decision making. In fact, we sent high resolution versions, a lot of the map inputs, as well as the outputs, the index layers, uh, to a meeting that they held in October 2013. People with different development portfolios came together and they were able to kind of sit around the table and discuss what they saw on the map. So it became a kind of important point for discussion and for exchange of ideas. It also assisted with geographic priority setting. My understanding is that they decided to or opted to move into the Mopti region, which is one region that had slightly less um, presence of other aid agencies and also was sort of in that moderate vulnerability zone. Um, we also learned about the importance of full transparency in the methods and presentation of the results. So one of the things that we did, we very, very carefully documented every data set that we included in the assessment, and we uh, provided full metadata or data about the data, source information, what statistical transformations were used, and any uncertainties or weaknesses that, that were, uh, could be documented, data limitations that were in the data. Uh, we also uh, mapped the uncertainty levels that we had for a number of the spatial data layers and presented that along with the final vulnerability map. Uh, and then we also used alternative methods such as principal components analysis and sensitivity analysis to see whether the results differed heavily when you change the assumptions in the way you aggregate the data. 
Finally, I just wanted to say there's been considerable interest in vulnerability mapping in a number of other countries. We held a training workshop for one uh, colleague from the Joint Planning Cell for the Sahel region uh, last uh, February. He left uh, our offices and went off and pr produced two vulnerability maps, one for Niger and another for Burkina Faso. Uh, we've conducted a training uh, under ARC's, um, the ARC project in our New York offices for eight professionals from West Africa, or all over Africa, I should say. In fact, they paid their own way, so that demonstrated their interests and their organizational interest in learning how to do this. And more recently, we've been doing uh, vulnerability mapping in East Africa under the prepared project. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alex. A uh, uh, wonderful presentation and uh, beautiful maps that you were able to produce. So I'd, I'd like to invite the audience to line up at the um, two microphones. Uh, we're going to have some time for question. If you do need to get up, get some coffee, anything else, please feel free to do so as well. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go, go for about 20 minutes here with questions, um, 15, 20 minutes, and, and then We'll also have some online questions as well. So if, if, you, if you would like to pose a question, please feel free to, to make your way to the microphones. Um, I have a question if, if nobody wants to volunteer. But um, I'm seeing, I, I believe, uh, Ken from, from Winrock is uh, stepping up. So as you do come up to the microphones, please provide your, your name and your institutional affiliation. And um, we're going to try and take a few questions at a time for, for the panel. So please, Ken, I'll, I'll let you go. Hi, I'll jump in just to kick things off and kind of warm up the crowd a little bit. I'm Ken Andrasco from Windrock International. Um, fantastic presentations, huge amount of information. I never heard the terms private sector or government at any point in any of the discussions. So my question is, since the benefits that you talk about are not monetized, how do you end up financing this kind of work? Is it likely to be a model of developing assistance forever into the future? Or do you have some way that you're likely to attract government roles so the government takes ownership of this or get private sector angle so it's more sustainable financially over time? Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Um, anybody else? Or I can let the panel go and you can all think about another question while I'm doing so. So, you know. That, that is something we'll talk about in the second panel for sure, but um, I saw Trish writing vigorously with some notes, so I could kick it over to you as the COP to take a first crack at that. I'll start off. We actually, um, as many of us mentioned in our presentation, we work very closely with um, local partners um, in terms of sustainability and, and transferring over uh, capacity. Um, the second panel will be talking a little bit more to that. Um, we think... Uh, through our learning from ARC, actually, um, by the time we did our, our last assessment in Western Honduras, I think we learned a lot more about cost effectiveness and, and how to do these assessments in a rigorous manner, but um, using um, local expertise, building up local expertise, working a lot more with our local partners like the MET services. Um, I still think, though, because of capacity at the local level, we're going to have to continue to invest in developing local capacity, particularly in the area of climate information services, and you know, continue working with um, agriculture research extension and making those investments. I don't know if my other colleagues want to. I'll just chime in on the private sector engagement piece from the perspective of uh, the Honduras assessment. So in ESAC, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, in his presentation. But after uh, the dissemination of, of the results of the, the vulnerability assessment uh, uh, in Honduras, uh, USAID actually had a request from uh, melon producers in southern Honduras who are seeking technical assistance uh, in terms of how to uh, implement uh, adaptive practices because they were already facing impacts. And that's the type of sort of private sector interest in, in these vulnerability assessments. And, you know, wanting to, to uh, receive technical assistance and, you know, finance it uh, themselves. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, that's the Honduras example, and there probably are others and, you know, and other assessments that ARC has done. Great. We um, could take one, one here from the floor, and then we'll, we'll go online, please. Okay. This is uh, Rodolfo Camacho from APTA Associates. 
Um, I have a question to the whole panel, I guess. Uh, if, if any of your work, you know, and this is very important work because that informs decision makers to what to do in terms of uh, climate change and climate variability. Um, but one, one question that I have is, is any of this work is being put to use by any planning organization, municipal, state, or national, in terms of actions that they will take on? Or, or who is doing the follow-up on this? Is it the missions? Uh, is the government? Uh, any, any details on that? That, that? that is panel two. Um, <laughs> those are all very important questions. We'll get into a lot of those uh, with each of the four speakers on panel two. But if anybody wants to quickly touch on anything, you know, I, I'd welcome you to. I think we'll leave it to panel two. But we did, when we did the assessments, as I mentioned, we really looked at several different levels um, in terms of gathering information and involving stakeholders. We looked at the household, community level, as well as the local level, including local government, district, or municipal level, and the national level, looking at institutions and what they can do to respond. So, Great, yeah, we're, we're panel two, the, the bar is being set high, so study your notes. <laughs> um, we'll maybe just take a few online and then we'll, we'll come to the floor. So uh, please, in the back, um, they're just gonna, kind of like the voice of, voice of God here is gonna <laughs> give us some questions. Hi. Um, we have 129 active participants currently on the web event, and there have been a couple of interesting side discussions that have been evolving uh, during your, your, your presentations. One area of interest has to do with stakeholder involvement. The web participants are wondering what were the challenges and the successes that you experienced in the countries where you worked, including challenges and successes that you had experienced when de dealing with farmers, and on a related question, whether or not you feel that the people that you worked with, the farmers in particular, really understand what climate change means. Any, would you like to put another one forward, or should we, should we tackle that? Yeah, I think you can tackle that one. All right, great. So that, that's, uh, everyone, everyone might have a little bit to say on that. David? Um, in the Senegal assessment, we worked very uh, closely with a couple of national institutions, the National Agricultural uh, Agency, as well as a semi-private uh, agency called the Center for Environmental Monitoring, CSU, an entrenched acronym. Um, and as I hinted at in my presentation, there was a lot of benefit um, from this. Sometimes you're, I mean, we were Americans in a foreign country. I and mean, obviously we, we, we knew it pretty well, felt like we knew it pretty well, but it was really nice to have someone who studied these issues or similar issues to, to uh, make sure, to sort of ground and make sure that we were on the right track. And as uh, Mamadou will present in the second panel, carry forward some of our results and some of the methods we used. Um, so there were great benefits. Some of the challenges, of course, um, are not unique to climate change. Um, these are not well-financed institutions. The staff, although extremely competent, is pulled in, particularly the best staff, is pulled in multiple different directions, um, coordinating our institutions here on this side of the, of the ocean with, with theirs uh, cause challenges, too. Um, I think uh, in climate assessments, we're working more and more with meteorological agencies in, in these various countries, and that's a whole other basket of, of challenges, uh, particularly in terms of, of financing, but, but there, there are other challenges there. Um, in uh, Senegal, in fact, uh, despite uh, months of, of, of uh, effort trying to figure out how we would work together, and in, in the end, we were not able to work with the uh, Met Service in, in Senegal, um, unfortunately. Um, in terms of farmers and farmers' understanding of climate change, that's a, that's a whole other question. Um, you know, we, we conducted household surveys and focus groups, similar issues you would have in doing that in any other sort of study. Uh, it is an interesting question, their understanding of climate change. Uh, that wasn't the focus of our study. Of course, we've, we've uh, had conversations with farmers. Uh, and I think one thing I've realized is that we don't really 
pay, we don't really give enough credence to the fact that farmers really have a very tight understanding of climate. And they're there experiencing it. It's weather, it's climate, but they're, they have a much more detailed understanding than even our super fantastic data crunching projections can sort of uh, create. Um, or our analysis of, of uh, collected uh, information from, from MET services. Climate is very complicated, and for a particular location, it's those folks there whose lives depend on understanding, reading, interpreting signs, understanding what's happened recently, how a particular soil, a particular variety of a particular crop will interact with a particular type of rainfall um, is really something that we, we cannot uh, model and we cannot understand uh, very fully, even through our elaborate scientific methods. So in that level, you know, whether it's weather, whether it's climate, um, in that level, farmers really do have a grasp of it. Um, and uh, in terms of, and I think all, when we presented in, in Mali, for example, a response to some of the technical folks we presented our assessment to, uh, said, well, you should go out and tell the farmers. It's, um, I think, from my point of view, I think farmers, what they need to know is basically, it, it could, it's, you know, it's, it's changing, it's gonna change in one direction, and it could be a lot worse. But all our details, we don't have details that they can really use at this point. Um, anyway, there's a couple of ideas I have uh, generated through this. Great, I'll thanks. just add just one thing. So in, in the Honduras assessment, uh, in our focus group discussions with farmers, one of the questions was uh, for them to think back over t the last 20 years to identify the sort of principal changes that affected their uh, production systems. And climate featured uh, very strongly uh, in the things that they, that they were cite citing. Um, there was some sort of difficulty differentiating from kind of natural climate variability, which features strongly in, uh, in the dry corridor versus sort of anthropogenic uh, climate change. But in terms of climate as a, as a major driver of, of changes and kind of adaptive practices and so on, farmers uh, regularly referenced, uh, referenced that as, a, as an important issue. Thank you, John, and, and thank you, David. Please uh, step forward. We'll probably, I think we'll take a, a couple of questions, so if, if there's someone else as well. Thank you. Um, great presentations, really very helpful. Um, there were two things I noted about the um, vulnerability assessment for Senegal that I thought were um, uh, good examples, and I'm wondering to what extent they were taken up by the others, or if that wasn't possible during the timing, to what extent they've been taken up in your recommendations for the future. Uh, and those two are, one, comparing the future projection with historical trends, which is really helpful in terms of getting things in context. Uh, and the other is that, th this may have just been left over off of the other presentations, but the, um, the Senegalese Institute for Agricultural Research was indicated as one of the partners. Um, and I think it's really important that to, to be looking at uh, adaptation of uh, species that, that may uh, uh, crop species that may be able to be more adapted to the future conditions. So I'm wondering to what extent that was addressed in others. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm just sorry, your name institution, please. I'm sorry, I thought I said that. Gene Brantley with RTI International. Great, thank you, Gene. Please. Hi, uh, my name is David Nicholson from Mercy Corps. Um, so, one of the questions I have, one of the challenges I guess I face as, a, as an advocate for going through these kinds of processes internally is this question about return on investment of going through this complex process and sort of ending up with perhaps broad adaptation strategies that could probably be guessed at from the beginning and we still end up with a level of uncertainty that means we end up with adaptation pathways which are pretty broad. So I guess I'm just wondering from hearing from the panel here the perspective of, you know, going through this extensive and you know relatively expensive process, can you talk a little bit about the return on investment that actually, and I realize we're gonna to get to some of the um, implications this afternoon, but just sort of coming out the other end of the assessment phase, do you feel that you learned enough to, to really be worthwhile? Um, I guess that's it. Thank you, a, a very, very relevant question that we're all wondering an answer for. So uh, ROI and um, how everything has been incorporated across the, the other CCVAs. Um, the Senegal assessment was the last 
assessment we conducted. Um, so, uh, and the approach of comparing historical climate change to projections uh, was used only in that assessment um, and has, wasn't able to be adopted in future assessments. Um, and for your second point about working with ISRA, uh, national agricultural agencies, um, it wasn't taken up by other assessments, but in Uganda, I know we worked with the national ag agency, NARO, in Honduras. We worked a lot with uh, municipalities, um, but it wasn't built in the design to have one specific uh, institution. Isaac will talk about all the, the institutions that were involved uh, during the sort of design process as well as now in the uptake. But there's been very much a sort of local uh, stakeholder involvement. Okay. Um, yeah, in terms of return on investment, um, we, you'll hear in the second panel that um, a lot of the stakeholders we presented at the local level are findings using different communication means so that people could understand. We developed scenarios that were actually in Uganda, each climate future scenario was different in each district, and so we modified them for each district so when we went there we could talk about their particular situation. Um, so I think communication was very important about these findings, and again, the second panel will talk about once they improve their understanding of what the implications are and what would happen, what they were able to do. At a national level, there were quite a few other donors that actually we're looking for this kind of information. In every country where, where we did these assessments, there was no other assessment that had been like, done like this before. And because that was unique and it was needed, really, both the government at high levels as well as other donor partners in those countries use the assessments to also inform their program plans and in some cases policies. And you'll hear, hear about that in the second study. So, you know, we tried to reach low and work very closely with the communities and farmers, making that information relevant to them so they could act on it, as well as at national level. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, we, we certainly did, had some uh, trial and error in our development of our methods. And if we were to do this again, we would hone in on the ones that were more, more effective. Um, on the other hand, I think a lot of what we were doing was creating understanding and, and sharing methods. Um, so in terms of the exact results we came up with in the end versus the amount of effort we put into it, I'm not sure you, you, know, you get a happy equation there. But I, I really think that um, not only our direct partners, but a lot of the people we presented to and worked with really changed their understanding of climate change. Uh, and the fact that our work was uh, rigorous led a certain amount of legitimacy and credibility to our responses and, and that much force uh, in their uh, understanding of, of uh, climate change as a result of our work. And David mentioned the learning. Um, I'm making a plug for the compendium that uh, you'll be able to pick up a copy or access it online after this meeting. Um, we did a, I think we did a good job of really documenting and sharing our lessons learned as we went from one assessment to the other. It's not necessarily a manual on how to, although we have some information in there on how we did our climate analyses and things like that. Um, I think we found the ARC team that doing these assessments is really as much of an art as it is a science. And you know, th those things you learn by doing them, actually. Hopefully, we can share those experiences and the rest of you can learn from it as well. Great, thank, thank you, Trish. David, we'll, we'll grab one more question and, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll shift, so please. Yeah, my name is Ben White from Integra LLC here in DC. Um, this is sort of a uh, observation slash question for Alex. I, I noticed that in your uh, climate uh, vulnerability maps, there was a increased uh, usage of remote sensing and earth observations. And I, I really like that because, you know, once you have the methodology down, it seems like uh, it can scale uh, tremendously uh, throughout the region. So I was wondering how you perceived uh, the evolution of your methodology uh, throughout West Africa and potentially uh, the continent at large. 
Great question. Um, so actually we run a NASA data center at season, so I can put in a plug for NASA. Our, our data sets are actually complementary to the satellite remote sensing data that NASA produces. So we produce population grids and infant mortality grids and malnutrition data sets that are useful kind of at global to regional scale analysis. But the point of doing that is to integrate the data sets across the disciplines and across so, um, yes, indeed, I think that there are certain things that can be measured from space. We use things like uh, variation in NDVI or greenness. We used uh, carbon, soil carbon based on MODIS uh, retrievals uh, and uh, rainfall, um, you know, proxies from satellite measurements like TRIM. Uh, I do think there's potential there. Uh, Still, measuring the social vulnerability aspects requires generally, you know, household surveys. Uh, increasingly, there's novel data, data streams such as call data records and things like that that can locate people in real time. But um, yeah, I do think that the potential for remote sensing in this area is, is, is expanding and, and uh, will be important for that kind of synoptic coverage for large regions. Thank you. Great. Uh, well. I'd like to thank the panelists. It was a wonderful job. I compressed a lot of information in a very short period of time. So uh, thank you very much for your active participation. Thank you. Um, feel free to grab a coffee. As Matthew mentioned, we'll do a quick transition here and bring the other panelists up. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, share with you a little bit about what we have learned along the way in terms of communicating the results of these studies, these climate change vulnerability assessments. Um, we found that there's no one-size-fits-all approach um, to effective communication because the level of knowledge on climate change varies across different countries and across different contexts. Um, it's instead necessary to really customize the communication strategy um, and develop tools that help different levels of expertise understand uncertainty and the other complex findings that are part of these studies. Therefore, we, find, we, we found it particularly useful to, to understand our audience, know who we're trying to communicate, and develop uh, a, a layered approach to communicating to those different levels of audience. While the climate change vulnerability assessments themselves are very deep and intense and have many annexes, as well as the recommendations and the, the, the approach to designing these assessments, they're often too complex for a lot of users to really effectively utilize the information and so we, we also develop a series of briefs and, and a shorter executive summaries that really help th people like policymakers um, and others who need a, fa a more rapid overview of the key findings from these assessments to capture those in these. Although it may sound like a no-brainer, translation of these materials is really critical. It's often uh, perhaps thought of as, a, as an afterthought, and it's really critical to build that in. Furthermore, simple tools like maps, climate envelopes, and other, uh, other uh, simplified communication materials have been pr proven very effective to working with local audiences to understand how climate change is going to impact uh, specific sectors um, and livelihoods in those communities. And then finally, uh, we, we of course uh, found the, a great deal of value in presenting the results, giving back to the communities where we've conducted these assessments through presentations and materials where we bring the team members, but also engage and involve the local uh, team members as well in communicating the results and recommendations from these assessments. So where can you find these and some other uh, useful recommendations and lessons from our experience? One is, as Trish mentioned, we've captured a lot of this information in the compendium, um, which is going to be uh, soon available on the ARC portal. The, our online home is the ARC portal um, on Eldis communities at community.eldis.org forward slash ARCC. Um, that's our online home for the climate change vulnerability assessments, the technical papers, and workshop reports. We also have, as I mentioned, the summaries and other uh, summarized information on that as, and, and our lessons learned, including the compendium. Here are just a couple resources that I, I hope you'll note down. Um, we, these resources, although not everything is currently available on the website, it soon will be by the end of November, and this website will last after ARC closes down in November. So with that, why don't I invite the second panel up?
Um, and we'll, we'll transition to the, the panel on uptake and to Matthew. Thank you very much, Leif. Um, I, I personally do not understand how Leif manages all of this information so effectively. He's done an outstanding job, and he's definitely been the, the brains behind this entire event. So um, my, my own gratitude is, is immense for, for all that he's done. He's done an outstanding job, and I really do hope that all of you will have an opportunity to go to the website and, and um, review these documents. Um, at, at your leisure. So um, as, as indicated earlier, uh, we've, um, we're going to have a second panel. I know a lot of people have asked questions already about what this panel is going to do. Um, and this is really, I think, going to get into everything that people here are really interested in knowing about. It's like, how is this information used and, and that whole process. So in terms of format, we're going to do the exact same thing as we did on the first panel. A couple of uh, you know, eight to 10 minute discussions followed by Q&A. Um, and I guess I, I, I quickly want to want to tee up this panel by providing you all with with a few terms that, that we've been using in regards to uptake. Um, and I guess initially I'll, I'll just mention as to like what does that mean uptake. Um, so for us, when we say that, we're talking about you know how the findings of a CCA and CCVA inform policy and programming and, and how that process occurs. That's that's the uptake that, that we're talking about. And we've found through ARC um, that there's several attributes um, that can increase uptake occurring. So there are th three words here, credible, legitimate, and salient. So when we refer to credible, we're talking about um, the product of the CCVA and its perceived technical quality. So credible is really about the product. Um, when we talk about legitimate, we're talking about the process that was undertaken for the CCVA and the level of access, acceptance that, of the findings is accurate that that process was able to, to ensure. And then when we mention salient, we're talking about the, the relevance and the timeliness of the information that the CCVA produced. And to ensure that there is that uptake and, and that the results are utilized, um, we, we need two sets of individuals to take part in this process. One set are knowledge brokers, and those are people who make the information more accessible and they interpret the design and the findings of the CCVA. And that's outside of the individuals who are actually conducting that process themselves. And then we also need champions, and those are people who are credible, and they may very well be decision makers or individuals who have access to decision makers. So those, I just wanted to provide those definitions because those five terms are, are about to get thrown around um, by all the different panelists, and, and you can just kind of take that into consideration as you hear from them. So we're gonna follow the exact same format in terms of countries, um, and so we're gonna start things off with um, Uganda, and um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Rita, uh, sorry, Rita Lake Ojek. She's the chief of party for the Uganda Ag Inputs Feed the Future program. It's a new assignment, so congratulations. And um, before this, Rita was a value chain specialist for the Uganda CCVA. She's, she's a Ugandan expert. She's been there for nearly 30 years working on agriculture and agribusiness development programs. And in Uganda, she's been working with many of the Feed the Future um, implementing partners to integrate climate change adaptation into the program activities. Her presentation is, is going to focus on you know, how, in fact, the CCVA was taken up across the, the development community at large, not just USAID and, and the government of Uganda. So Rita, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. As uh, Trish mentioned uh, in her earlier presentation, the design of the Uganda Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment, which was the first one that was done, really focused on the objective of being able to guide USAID Uganda in its programming decisions as it was designing its Feed the Future responses. But there was also an objective to provide an evidence-based information set that would be of use to the entire ag sector in Uganda. And in order to achieve this, what they did was to design a very participatory and iterative process. 
Uh, as Trish mentioned, this participation started all the way from the beginning at the time of the coping, scoping mission. It progressed through the data collection in terms of focus groups, key informant interviews, stakeholder reviews. There was an active process of scenario development to apply the results to the local situations in each of the pilot districts, uh, which was then validated during the options analysis. And all of this was not only to disseminate the results of the, the findings, but to really validate and in, engage the participants in the discussion of what is the implication of these findings? How is it going to change our standard operating procedures? How is it going to change the way we think about agriculture, the way we think about development? And this process then was already engaged at the time of the, of the options analysis, which was in January of 2013. That input greatly uh, impacted on the results that came out in terms of the national and local level recommendations that were eventually published in the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment Report, which came out in roughly August of uh, 2013. At that time then, there was a conscious decision on the part of the mission uh, in Uganda to bring these results back to the districts where the data origi originated. Uh, and these are just some of the photos of the engagement that took place with this, the key stakeholders um, in order to really get them to start thinking about implications. And this was done at a series of meetings, not only with district officials, but with all of the uh, USAID implementing partners across the various sectors, not just agriculture, but also health, education, uh, and, and the other areas in which USAID is involved. So through this participatory process and the promotion of local champions, the vulnerability assessment was really able to inform and inspire a wide range of climate change adaptation interventions uh, across a broad, broad spectrum of stakeholders and institutions. So in just to sort of summarize the way in which the CCVA was able uh, to have an impact. The vulnerability assessment results informed USAID programming as was originally expected and were built into the whole design of the Feed the Future um, uh, project activities in Uganda. But it went beyond that point. It was able, it was taken up as baseline information which was involved then and used in the design of new project interventions from other donors, including GIZ, the World Bank, DFID. It also for, informed national policy formulation. It was a, provided a sound evidence base on which the uh, national climate change strategy and implementation plan was based and was then built into the most recent national development plan, uh, which is the next five-year development plan for Uganda. And at that level, the National Planning Authority and the Climate Change Authority uh, drew up guidelines for the mainstreaming of climate change adaptation into the district development planning process and budgeting. It's also been taken up uh, by various research uh, institutions, including the FAO, IITA, and the National Agricultural Research Organization for purposes of reviewing the portfolio of existing um, agriculture interventions, uh, identifying gaps and, and research needs for prioritization of climate change uh, moving forward in the design of future research activities. Um, and this whole process, as, as Matthew mentioned, was really affected by this issue of salience, credibility, and legitimacy. Um, these uptake activities were reinforced by these perceived qualities. In terms of salience, the timing of the climate change vulnerability assessment was very important. It was 
came out at a time when climate was really on everybody's uh, radar. And therefore, uh, the donors were actively looking for solid information on which to base programming decisions. The government was looking for solid information on which to base policy decisions. And because this study was undertaken by credible scientists working closely with local institutions, especially the uh, Meteorological Authority and the National Agricultural Research Organization, there was a credibility to the results that came out. This was the first high quality climate change analysis to be done based on 60 years of um, weather data, which was downscaled into these six regional models, so that there was a strong empirical foundation uh, for the results that came out. And this was then strengthened by the uh, large-scale uh, livelihoods research that was done. And then the participatory process by which various institutions were involved in the uh, analysis and recommendations that came out at the national and the local levels really created a legitimacy for the process. And as Matthew has also mentioned, the knowledge brokers and champions were very key to this whole process. Um, the ARC team themselves, the members of the uh, various organizations that came together to carry out the vulnerability assessment, were the front line in terms of being knowledge brokers. They had a very important role in translating a very complex study with various components into information that was accessible to the local population to be able to, to make the results clear, to understand the implications as well as the uncertainties, and to really engage the community in dialogue about where things were going to be going. Uh, in terms of champions, in Uganda, Hadas Kushner, who happens to be here in the back, thank you very much for coming. Uh, within USAID, she played a critical role in being able to convince the mission of the importance of the vulnerability assessment, uh, to be able to translate the results of the vulnerability assessment into specific program design, and putting together a very effective portfolio of interventions within Uganda that put climate change in the forefront, in the forefront in terms of uh, enabling environment, uh, marketing, access to um, agricultural inputs, access to weather information, and access to training and educational systems. It was also important that she was the uh, co-chair of the donor forum on climate change, and therefore was able to uh, bring the results of the vulnerability assessment to the attention of the other international donors and institutions and um, encourage them to make use of the findings. But rapidly, the role of champions was then devolved initially to the Feed the Future project activities and then consciously through the Feed the Future activities to other um, uh, stakeholders within the government institutions. And I just want to quickly run you through uh, an example of how this process took place. Initially, whoops. Initially, it was USAID and, e and the Enabling Environment Activity, which is one of the Feed the Future projects, which shared the results of the vulnerability assessment. They then went on to engage with the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Local Government, and the Ministry of Water and Environment to do local level sensitization on the importance of mainstreaming climate change into planning and budgeting. The next stage was to involve the Ministry of Finance and the National Planning Authority in carrying out trainings of trainers for champions, local level champions in, in mainstreaming climate change in planning and using the planning tools of the government uh, to incorporate climate change. These champions then went back to the communities to train the local uh, planning committees. And then the Ministry of Local Government was able to come on board and really take ownership of the process 
and include climate change indicators in the national district assessment tool. And this created a, a carrot because how much resources the districts get from the central government depends on how well they perform on the district assessment tool. So by incorporating climate change criteria, it really added an, a, a financial incentive to the districts to be able to mainstream climate change in their planning and budgeting. And lastly, to involve the office of the prime minister, who has the mandate under the climate change strategy to carry out monitoring of impacts. So this was the process of, of devolving the champions from being within USAID to really involving various government institutions. The process also evolved geographically. It started out in the six pilot districts and then in collaboration with FAO was rolled out to the areas which are primarily in the livestock corridor because you said you dealt more with crops. FAO is dealing more with livestock uh, livelihoods and then into all of the Feed the Future activities which are the various shaded areas. And of course, under the National Planning Authority, it's now being devolved into a na to cl incorporating climate change at the national planning level. So in summary, through a participatory process, the um, vulnerability assessment was able to influence direct procurement decisions on the part of USAID, project design from other donors, capacity of existing local government institutions rolled out into the national and, and local planning, and capacity building for other key stakeholders in terms of research, NGOs, and private sector players. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, very informative. And um, you know, one thing I'll just highlight is that these CCVAs have taken place over time, so the scale of uptake it is, as you go through the various presentations will be different. We've had a little bit more time in Uganda to, to see how it's been picked up, and, and you will note that, but that's very impressive, and it, it's wonderful to see the, the applicability of the results. So moving over to Senegal, um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Mamadou Baro. He's a faculty member um, in the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology at the University of Arizona. When he's not, um, you know, when he's not doing his day job, he's he's working on various assessments, um, such as the Arc, uh, the Senegal CCVA, where Mamadou was the the field research coordinator. Um, th this is this is this is a this is a this is a great presentation, um, and through this presentation, we're gonna we're gonna really see how the stakeholders were were engaged in the uptake process. So, Professor Barrow, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And uh, this is really exciting, an exciting time, as uh, Ralph Anderson said, in terms of uh, being able to do something that uh, people are going to use. Because, uh, and that's why the title of this uh, communication is Design Assessment to be Used. Something is actually going to be um, taken to the communities and something going to be done about it instead of just having reports and be sitting on shelves. Uh, so it's uh, it's interesting actually um, what David you know said about uh, you know uh, setting the groundwork for the work to be actually uh, used you know in development planning um, and a lot of work went into actually making the uh, the context understanding the context and also making sure that at the end of the day uh, the information is going to be uh, used uh, so we try to bring the gap between the resource and their application in development and. Uh, the key words here in terms of uh, salience, uh, salience, credibility, and legitimacy are uh, uh, critical. Um, and uh, in Senegal, we try to use uh, reputable uh, and credible national institutions, uh, such as uh, ISRA, which is the Senegalese Agricultural Research Institute, and CES, uh, which is the Ecological Monitoring Center. These two institutions are uh, uh, key in terms of uh, helping us you know, get to not only credible information, because that's important. I mean, uh, my colleague Alex mentioned early on about the, I mean, the wonderful maps, the great job that was done, you know, in, in Mali. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, you, uh, you can produce, you know, interesting reports and interesting maps, but the, what comes in is as information, the data you get in is, is, uh, has to be good, good, good data. So uh, that's why, you know, credibility is very important and being able also to have, to have institutions that actually are credible and, and, and within them also researchers who have a good reputation 
helps really build you know the ground for uh, making sure that at the end of the day you know you get you know the, the information is going to be helpful so the active collaboration with local institutions also increased relevance to decision maker and the salience of the finding as did the participation of government and donors representative in the scoping mission and in the late, later phases of the assessment in which options were discussed and prioritized and here i would like to insist on uh, because we usually talk a lot about participation and we talk about capacity building, but sometimes, you know, um, it's, uh, it's not done, you know, uh, in, in a systematic way. I mean by that, involving the, the stakeholders at the beginning um, of the process, in the middle also at the end of the process. And this was key in Senegal. Uh, and it was interesting to uh, notice that people were very excited because they felt like, well, this isn't just, you know, something that they have to follow because somebody is funding it, but they, they saw the interest on, on, on doing that. And the timing also, as I said, was very critical in, in the sense that, you know, everybody, um, the communities were facing serious issues that have to do with climate change and the impact, you know, on farming and on livestock raising and things like that. But also the institutions were trying to also to come to, uh, to grasp, you know, those, those things and to be able to provide some useful uh, recommendations. So the collaboration with national research institutions, along with the participation of government donor representative, helped to strengthen the legitimacy of our findings by taking opposing views and stakeholder values into serious consideration. The idea of having also opposing views, sometimes, you know, I mean, there are different sides to a story, and uh, we try to get, you know, people who had different perspectives on these issues, uh, to have them, you know, argue and, and present the evidence that they have, and we also focus a lot on getting the best available evidence at the moment, and that was very interesting. At the end, we were able to, to build some kind of consensus. Uh, so this participation at the beginning and also at the end of the process was, was, was critical. I would like now to insist on uh, the role that, uh, you know, the um, uh, champions and the advocates and the brokers, you know, play. I, uh, I, we believe the, this attention to producing results that have uh, salience, credibility and legitimacy has resulted in greater uptake of our findings. It not only strengthened the quality of the assessment findings and recommendation, but it also strengthened a process through shared expertise that was very interesting because we had different people with different level of expertise, and, but all that was shared. Expertise that built the capacity and involvement of the natural knowledge brokers and advocates for those results. USAID uh, Senegal plays an important role in, in, in all this. I mean, they were uh, at the forefront and they helped us, you know, uh, be in touch with the credible institutions and organizations. Um, and they have a, a good uh, essential memory of research in Senegal. So, uh, that was very interesting. The, also, the role that uh, uh, CS and then ISRA played also was uh, was critical to the to, uh, in terms of being able to make sure that we believe now you know the, the results you know would be would be used. Uh, but I also would like to uh, before presenting the evidence of uptake, uh, uh, let me first say that the Senegal assessment has only recently been finalized. It's still early to expect evidence of its impact on governmental and donor strategic planning and policy. What I can present here are the indication, as reported to us by representatives of CSE, ISRA, IPAR, and local community leaders of how people intend to use the assessment results. Um, we had uh, the process was a long one. Um, as I said from the beginning, all the major uh, stakeholders, in including representative of uh, you know uh, private, I mean uh, civil society and the private sector were involved in the process. And so we, 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 uh, we had exit meetings, you know, uh, with, the, with the communities, went back in the field and tried to share the results of the, of the work with the, with the community members that were there. And they were very excited about it because, of, and uh, it was exciting actually when we, when we were talking to them and they were saying, well, rarely people actually come back to us and to, you know, to share the results of the study that they did. So this was uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, the response to our presentation to the assessment result to stakeholders in Dakar suggested that they are on target and will be used. 80% uh, of the participants who represent, rep represented the government, donors, and NGO affirmed that the presentation increased their understanding of climate change adaptation. So they, uh, and that's a very high percentage. And 88% reported that they would use the assessment result in, this, in, uh, in their work. Uh, these percentages were the result of an exit survey conducted in Senegal. The most direct client of the assessment, USAID Senegal, might in the long run be an, uh, an important knowledge broker as they integrate the result of the assessment into the development program for Senegal. 
the mission indicated interest in using the assessment to inform not only any potential investment in Senegal, but they also asked ARC to apply the research finding to other parts of the country, noting that it is expected to inform their next country development uh, cooperative strategy. Uh, a champion of the assessment, USAID Senegal, provided a brief of the assessment to the, to the authors of the ECOWAS uh, regional investment plan, who indicated that they would include it as an annex to the plan. So that is also an important uh, element in terms of uh, um, uptake. The staff of the two Senegalese research institutions that collaborated on the assessment with ARC, uh, CSE and ISRA, are likely to play the role of champions of the study as they use and transmit their approaches to the study findings. Both institutions, ISRA and CSE, are planning to use the assessment report as a background document uh, for new program initiative on climate change adaptation in Senegal. They are also independently noted that these findings will be used to inform Senegal next climate change adaptation communication now being written. Um, I came back from Senegal uh, about uh, four weeks ago and uh, they are actively working you know, on you know, the, the CSE and ISRA and also now IPAR uh, to you know, all the three institutions trying actually to, to see what, uh, how they're gonna be influencing the process in the, in the long run. Um, and then the individual staff members of the institution have also declared their intention to transform the report produced for the assessment into journal articles and have all the members of the research team uh, also uh, do that. One member of the research team in the in US has already presented results from the assessment to a symposium at the University of, uh, of Florida. Uh, IPA, uh, which is the Initiative Prospective Agriculture uh, Rural, one of the biggest think tanks in Senegal has been inspired by the study and plan to add some of the findings to their debate on public policy in agriculture and rural development in West Africa. CSE, ISRA, and project representative passed the assessment to ISRA. So that's, that's also very interesting to, uh, uh, to, to see now these institutions now collaborating on, on, the, same, on the same topic. Um, the, uh, finally, one of the most important ardent consumers of the assessment results appeared during the presentation of, of the study. Uh, those are the local uh, community leaders. We, we, uh, when we went back to the Eastern Senegal, we had meetings with the uh, community leaders. We have a uh, representative of civil society, and we shared the results with, uh, with, with them. And they are now planning to take the information and to enter it into the next you know, uh, strategic plan for, for, for at, at the local level, which is very, very interesting. Uh, participants were very engaged and vocal. They requested copies of our PowerPoint and insisted that the results should be shared uh, widely with the community concerns. And there are plans of, uh, right now being made to make that information available to those uh, communities. We, uh, somebody said earlier that uh, when we do the assessment, it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes more art than science, and that's really uh, true because you, we learn from the experience in, in Uganda and then we improve that in, in, in Senegal. And the idea now also is going to use artists, you know, in, from the eastern part of Senegal, uh, Baba Mal, who's a very well-known artist in, uh, in, uh, in that part of the country, who, uh, who is now an advocate and uh, who plans also to use, you know, that, that, that information to be, a, to be in a position actually to raise awareness about the, some of the impact of climate change and to also help communities, you know, deal with those, uh, those issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Mamadou. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, are there gonna be any royalties associated with Baba Mall using um, a CCVA? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I was really excited to see Baba Mall picking this up. He's an artist that I really enjoy listening to. Um, so we're gonna quickly move over to uh, Western Honduras. Um, so Isak Ferreira, is uh, with USAID in Honduras. He's the Global Climate Change Program Management Specialist at, at the mission. And um, when the assessment was going on, he was the principal mission staff member working with, with the team that, that John Parker outlined earlier in, in, the, in the morning. Um, Isak is, a, is an academic um, by training. Uh, he, he's since left academia uh, to work with USAID. He's, he's also taken a, a, a number of fairly prominent roles in Honduras dealing with climate change. He, he's a member of the delegation to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and he's an associated member of the Climate Finance Advisory Service for Developing Countries. Uh, 
we're gonna, we're gonna get a, have a have a have a good discussion on how um, broad uh, governmental engagement occurred uh, through the CCVA process. So, Isak, um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. For at least 20 years, Honduras has been identified as one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. Uh, in 2013, the Global Climate Risk Index ranked Honduras as the most vulnerable country based on per capita uh, human and economical losses. Um, drought and floods are common every year and put the country at high risk. This year, a typical ENSO year, Honduras went from a drought that affected more than 100,000 families to flooding episodes that had negative social and economical impacts in the north, south, and west of Honduras. The Honduran government has made efforts to address this vulnerability, especially through the creation of an institutional framework. In 2010, a national strategy on climate change was approved by the government. Uh, the same year, uh, uh, the climate change directorship was created, and these are the two main instruments that there are being used by the government to promote adaptation and mitigation actions in the country. And in 2013, uh, climate change law was passed by National Congress. Since 2010, several stakeholders, including USAID, have been working together to promote adaptation and mitigation actions uh, in Honduras. However, most of what has been envisioned and prioritized needs to be targeted, investments have to be made, uh, cultural practices changed, and regulations enforced. A starting point is to provide good information for, for, for good decision making, and, and which is probably one of the most common challenges that are uh, identified in documents that are written on this topic. And that is why this study is relevant. Not many uh, climate variability and change studies have been uh, carried out in Honduras. To my knowledge, this is the first multidisciplinary study addressing the impact of climate change on uh, livelihoods and ecosystems, especially in the rural areas where poor people depend heavily on natural resources and um, environmental goods and services. The report has um, introduced new concepts to the stakeholders, such as the social ecological vulnerability and climate envelope for ecosystems. The, the, this, this report also um, has provided some findings that are not new, but they confirm things that we already uh, were aware of and, and make us more confident about our programs. Some other findings are new, for example, uh, the one about cloud forests. According to the study, because of changes in temperature and precipitation, cloud forests will become gradually a new type of ecosystem, and by then affecting uh, the capacity of water capture and then to make this water available for the population. Currently, thousands of communities in the south, west, and, and, and uh, east of Honduras depend heavily on, on water that is generated in these uh, cloud forests. This is an example of a finding that is, a, that is a, actually a threat that requires action. For our mission, this uh, study had three objectives. The first one was to learn about these mid-term climate projections. The second one was to understand what would be the impact of these climate projections in livelihoods and ecosystems. And the third one was to identify existing and potential uh, responses that could be integrated into USAID, Government of Honduras, and other donors programming. The study was completed just a few months ago. Uh, however, it has already achieved some positive impact uh, by encouraging more attention to climate variability and change, both internally within USAID uh, and externally. Externally, the study has been presented to, to, to at least two um, key multi-stakeholder platforms. The first one is the Alliance for the Dry Corridor. The Alliance for the Dry Corridor is an initiative that is led by the government of Honduras, but is based on our experience and our approach in the Feed the Future activities. Five donors and the government of Honduras are working together to increase nutrition and to reduce poverty in one of the poorest and most vulnerable areas uh, in the country. Um, after this uh, study was presented, the Alliance for the Dry Corridor and the government of Honduras decided and, and take the, took the decision um, to make sure that our uh, climate 
projections and concerns should be taken into consideration in the design of these new projects. Uh, the study helped to put back into the agenda a concern that we, as a mission, already had. And, uh, uh, and, and that has been uh, very important uh, because now we are expecting to see a more uh, interconnected work between the agricultural and the natural resources sector in order to increase the resilience of, of the population. Uh, more investments on, on water, on water capture, on, on water uh, management, on water distribution um, are, are also expected. The other um, platform where this study has been presented is the uh, Agricultural Committee on Climate Change. In this case, this uh, multi-stakeholder um, uh, platform that is led by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, but universities, donors, NGOs, and, and other stakeholders are part of it, um, they are, what, what they want is to uh, promote a more resilient agriculture in whole Honduras. And, and uh, what they are doing now is that they are drafting a strategy on how to integrate these climate concerns in the work that uh, is being done by the dire directorships that are part of the ministry. And this is the starting point for uh, a, a more work that will be done on, on, on climate smart agriculture in, in the country. And one of the key documents that they are using as a reference is, reference, I'm sorry, is this uh, vulnerability assessment. Uh, similarly, this, this study has been, uh, or, or is being used by private sector and, 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 and other uh, USAID projects uh, as, a, as a key reference, um, but what maybe we can talk later about with more details uh, during the break or, or, or during lunch. Uh, regarding this. Uh, I just want to mention as well that the document has been uh, very useful for, for USAID because it has provided new elements uh, on how to uh, integrate climate concerns into our uh, strategies and programs. Now, uh, because of the findings, we are, we are taking uh, a closer look to these no regret, lower regret adaptation measures, such as the conservation of critical ecosystems, especially water research areas, uh, things like to how to scale up climate smart agricultural practices, um, to how to make climate information available, uh, increase the technical capacities to address climate risk, uh, diversify incomes through off-farm uh, employment. Uh, these are just examples of things that we have to take a, a, a closer look at. Uh, so I would say that this study has come really at a very good time. Uh, because heavy investments are being uh, designed in Honduras in the agricultural sector. Um, our mission recognizes that there is a lot to be done regarding uh, adaptation to climate variability and change. We recognize that our cooperation efforts should be based on the best available uh, information, but our contribution to the country begins with increasing the understanding of the impact of this climate variability and change not only for our agency, but first and foremost for the general public and for the decision makers in the country. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Isak, for that informative discussion. And it's, it's really wonderful to hear that just a few months out, there's been so much progress made. Um, so the, the last discussion on this panel, we're going to head back over to Molly. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Apatsos, uh, who many of you know. He's uh, here at USAID in Washington as a climate change advisor in the Africa Bureau. For the last couple of years, um, Alex has worked very closely with ARC, um, in particular on the West Africa Vulnerability Assessment, of which the Mali mapping effort was a very important component. Uh, Alex is going to go through um, the uptake process which occurred with the Mali mapping tool and communicate how that was um, passed on to stakeholders and also talk about some of the limitations that, you know, that such a medium of communication may have. So please, Alex. Thank you very much, Matthew. You. And I, I invite you all to take a deep breath. We've gone through seven of the presentations. You have one left. You're almost done. Um, but before I be begin, I also wanted to really put credit where credit's des deserved for these. It really goes to Alex for creating the maps and then our colleagues out in the mission in Mali who have really been at the forefront of, of pushing this forward. I love these talks, so I get to sit up front and take some credit sometimes for work that other folks have done. Uh, we've now presented these maps at a variety of different fora, both within our mission in Mali, as well as to an event we held in Bamako in September, 
uh, where we had 80 different Malian uh, stakeholders come in and view all the different aspects of the vulnerability assessment that we've conducted for the country. And pretty much across all of those four, we've had a very positive, enthusiastic response around these maps. People have been very interested to, to figure out how they can use them in their planning and begin to understand what is the underlying analytical foundation behind them. And our mission director in Mali even came up to us and said, you know, these are really the kind of the decision-making tools we need. We need more of these tools. And he had his staff pit, uh, print poster-sized maps to put up on the walls in one of their conference rooms because it really was something that they wanted to use as they thought a little more strategically about how to develop programming in Mali. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. The first is, is these, maples, these maps are so simple and so clear. You can put the maps up and you can see so quickly, even if you don't have a technical background in climate change, that red is bad, blue is better. And so you can quickly see that there's higher vulnerability in the north, there's less vulnerability in the south, and specifically around Bamako. And what that does is it helps you get past some of that nuance of those discussions. I mean, what you've heard today is how complex and how technical and how detailed some of these assessments can be. And what this does is really help you with the visu visualization and communication tool. So we've already used it in a, in a number of different manners. The first one was to work with the mission in the development of their climate change program. And essentially, as Mali was coming out of sort of their, their issues around the coup and the, and the conflict in the north, they wanted to develop very quickly an 18-month program where there was high vulnerability to climate change, but also where there were people. So what we could very easily do is we could take this map that shows vulnerability to climate change and where all the people are, and you can quickly identify areas geographically where you have those two intersecting. And so it wasn't, it wasn't, and it wasn't just for us to make those decisions, but we wanted the leadership to help explain to them why we had chosen a certain geography to help them see very quickly that yes, we're in an area that has high vulnerability, but we also have the potential to reach a large percentage of people. We don't necessarily always want to develop our program where the vulnerability is the highest if there aren't people there necessarily to help. I also wanted to elaborate a little bit on a point that Alex made in his talk, is what these maps really also allow us to do is have a common framework with which to start discussions with folks in other sectors. Oftentimes, we've, or at least I have, have struggled within aid to have conversations with people outside the environment sector because folks in health, folks in democracy, folks even sometimes in ag have a very different culture. They have a different vernacular and they have a different technical way of speaking. And sometimes if you start with that technical conversation, you struggle a little bit and it's, it's difficult to get people's interest. But essentially, if you can start from a, a similar framework where we have our map of climate vulnerability, they have maps of what are the indicators most important to them, malnutrition rates, uh, child stunting, you can quickly identify areas within the country where those overlap. And then through that discussion, you can get people actually interested and involved with uh, understanding how climate change might impact their programs. And for Mali, this was specifically important because at the time they were developing their resiliency strategy, which requires or uh, encourages them to layer and sequence their programs. So in certain geographies, you want to have your health, your climate change, your ag programs, all working towards a similar goal, which is sort of reducing that large, longer term humanitarian caseloads. And so these maps really allowed us to engage in those discussions. And then finally, the, the mission also was starting to think about their next mission-wide strategy, their country cooperation development strategy. And what we could do is we could take our map and we could lay it down next to where their current programs are, and that allowed us to do two things. At first, it helped us identify within their current portfolio where were the programs that were most likely to be impacted by climate change. And that helped us start the discussion of, perhaps to achieve your objectives, you're going to need to uh, consider climate change. We weren't trying to change their objectives, we're trying to get them to understand how their objectives that were important to them could be impacted on climate change. It also helps in the larger discussion around how do we think about developing a new cooperation and development strategy within the country, how to strategically align programs depending on what those higher level objectives are. And so these maps really did allow us a, a very easy framework to begin discussions with a wide range of people in the mission, and I really feel that they were more eager and more engaged with us in, the, in terms of climate change because we were more easily able to relate with them through these maps. There's a number of reasons that I think the maps also were, were actually allowed that. And the first one really is credibility. And I think it, these maps had a large amount of credibility for two reasons. The first is, is that you put seasons named next to something. I mean, they're the, more or less some of the best in the world at what they do. And that adds an instant air of credibility to a map. I think the second thing that really made these maps credible is that they didn't contradict what people already believed. People already assumed that people were more vulnerable in the north, less vulnerable in the south. And when you reinforce people's perceptions, that tends to add credibility to that. I do want to comment on the question that the gentleman from Mercy Corps made this morning, 
I think even though we were reconfirming what people already perceived, what this did is it allowed us to have an analytically rigorous product that we could take to people and say, yes, people perceive this is true, but we've also shown analytically it is also true. And we noticed within our mission discussions that having that analytical document made carried much more weight than just the perceptions alone. What I will be curious going forward is if we start to produce maps that contradict what people think, how that affects their views of credibility around these maps. The next one is salience, and, and a huge shout out goes to Alex and his team here. We literally gave them a very short time frame. We said, we're going to Mali in October. We need to have the maps before then. Alex and his team did a heroic effort to literally email us the maps as we were flying to Mali. And I will say that if we didn't have those maps then, Alex could have produced maps that were 10 times better, but a month later, and they wouldn't have had a fraction of the impact because some of those key discussions and those key decision points would have passed and it would have been much harder to go back and try to get the maps integrated into those discussions. And so that brings us to legitimacy. And I think here is where we, we had a little strategic balancing act because we needed salience, because we needed those maps at the time we needed them. We didn't necessarily have the time to go out and really do a lot of the local context and really engage a lot of the Malian stakeholders in some of these discussions. And we have had people come back to us and say, well, have you considered this? Or did you engage this stakeholder? Or have you ground truthed it? And I think for this map, it wasn't so much of an issue because it was sort of a targeting map, a wide scale map. I think legitimacy will become much more important as if you try to take these maps and refine them down more spatially. So you're getting down to a city level or a community level. And there we'll have to think a lot more strategically about how we balance these three different uh, pieces that really allow maps to be useful. And then because I've always been taught key, uh, the key to retention is repetition. Clarity and simplicity. If these maps weren't clear and they weren't simple, none of this stuff else would matter. They really have to be clear. They really have to be simple. And we were constantly told by the map, the mission, we want one map. We want one map. If you give us three maps, we'll just start to get confused. So give us one map that you are confident is the best map you can produce. I say that because the, these, this is a wonderful tool. It's a very good communication and visualization tool. So I have a hard time with really long words. I shouldn't have put as many in here. Um, but it's just a tool. And the reason that's important is, and Alex hinted at this earlier, is in, like any tool, it's only good as what it's based on. So these maps are only really as good as the data and the analysis that goes into them. If you put garbage into them, you're going to get garbage out of them. The challenge with maps is even if you put garbage in and get garbage out, you're still going to have a very pretty map. And so it'll be very difficult for a decision maker to say, well, is this very pretty map good? Or is this very pretty map not good? And so that really suggests two things. First. It's a really an impetus, an impetus, not use big words. It's a really a reason for people to actually push for these countries to collect these, these data and make them useful. Because if they want tools to make decisions off of, they need to provide the data. And secondly, what it is, is it's really where the knowledge brokers and the champions comes in. It's the knowledge broker's role to really understand that analytical foundation behind the map so that it can work with decision makers to ensure that the maps are being used in the most appropriate manner. And then the champions come in, not so much to get people excited and jazzed about the maps. I mean, that happens naturally. People just like maps for some reason. I love maps. Um, and what the champions are for is to say, now that I've got you excited about climate change through this map, now let's look at the rest of the vulnerability assessment where all that nuance is in there. We know the where. Now let's think about the what and the how and how we can start integrating climate change into your other programs to help you achieve your objectives. And that's actually worked quite well on the mission. And I think without the maps, our champions wouldn't have been as effective of getting other people interested in the, the climate change vulnerability assessments. I'm gonna to try to take us full circle here, if I can get the button to work. Um, and so essentially, what ARC has also done is they've created all of these foundational documents. And so for, for people who are interested, they actually created a nice foundational document that talks a lot about creating these maps and these indices. So you can create those champions and those knowledge brokers who can actually understand what's behind these maps. Because oftentimes it, it can be quite confusing and you can see very quickly what the limitations are and you can very quickly be able to take and decide is a map appropriate for what I'm trying to do or is it not. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and, and thanks for, for the plug to um, one of the uh, publications that ARC has produced. Um, that, that publication along with many others will be available for, for you all to, to grab in a little bit. But before we do so, I'd, I'd like to invite um, members of the audience here to, to step forward with any questions that you may have. We'd love to, love to get a few in before we move to our uh, final event. And we'll also field some questions from the online community as well. So great, we've got three individuals. So please um, 
state your name, your affiliation. Maybe we'll take all three of these questions and then we'll, we'll go uh, see to the online community. So please go ahead. Morning, my name is Moshmi Chaudhary. I'm from the World Resources Institute and very much enjoyed your presentations. My first question is regarding establishing credibility, salience, and legitimacy. And I wanted to know um, your experience with establishing these very core components of an uptake-ready CCVA. Were, was it um, a complementary experience? Did, was it, um, establishing credibility helpful for you to establish salience and vice versa? Or were there trade-offs um, between the between credibility and salience, where you were able to establish salience but had a difficult time establishing credibility? And my other question relates to communication, which I think is absolutely critical in terms of connecting science with decision making. And um, Alex, you alluded to the fact that, that maps really helped you communicate um, what was, you know, part of the CCVA. Um, but it's, it's, it's really about not just what you communicate, but how you communicate and how you communicate uncertainties in particular. And I'm wondering if you could expand on that based on your experience of how you translated uncertainty into the decision-making realm. Thank you. Hi, my name's Anita Campion. I'm with Conexus Corporation. We're the ones that organized the annual Cracking the Nut Conference. And uh, this upcoming year, we're focusing on you know, dealing with issues in rural and agricultural markets amid climate change. Uh, and I, first of all, I want to thank you. I think this was a really helpful framework and gives some really good detail into how we need to integrate this kind of language and thinking into our work. Um, I was at another session here at USAID a week ago with rural and ag development and finance specialists, and, and it was clear that we hadn't really thought that much about what the implications are of climate change. So. My question, because we're going to be doing this conference and we do a publication, hoping to have an influence on getting the message out on how important it is to in integrate all this thinking into the way we do our work, um, what should we be considering in terms of the different types of stakeholders that you all tried to influence? You know, is there a certain order of stakeholders to convince, you know, and then and what types of alterations in the ways the communications need to happen in order to make sure that the message is heard and received and that um, your, the information is being used and acted on. And then in particular, as Isaac mentioned, the, the private sector role. How do you, what kinds of information do is particularly useful to the private sector? You know, any sense of what they're willing to pay for, what they're interested in, and how do we bring them into this discussion as well? Moffat Gogi from the Bureau for Food Security here at USAID. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I, really, I really think that uh, the, this kind of an exchange and all the work that ARC has done uh, really is worth a lot of uptake. So looking forward to that. I have specific questions, a uh, question for Mamadou. Uh, as, as we heard from Rita, there was sort of that, that government-wide and sort of multi-sectoral kind of adoption uh, of uptake uh, and I think David mentioned that in, in Senegal there was a problem uh, or there was um, the meteorological folks didn't really kind of get on board. So what kind of advice would you have in terms of making sure that all the critical stakeholders come on board because the med service, for instance, is a critical part and uh, what are some lessons learned specifically? What were the challenges with the meteorological group in uh, Senegal? Uh, can, can I just comment on that? Thanks. Me from uh, uh, UC Davis, uh, Humphrey Fellow. My question is about the women's vulnerability in facing climate effect of climate change. Uh, as women and girls are differently, are certainly more severely affected by the effect of climate change, and uh, for different reasons, including social norms, including the fact that they have less access to resources, less access to incomes in agriculture, in food security. We know that women play a major role in food security if improving the livelihoods, the livelihoods at the household level. So my question is how the vulnerability assessment take into consideration the women's vulnerability, the needs of women that are different from men women, for men needs. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Those are um, four sets of very uh, good questions. Someone actually took my canned question. I didn't feed it, so I appreciate that being asked. Um, and I, I guess also that last question, there may be some individuals on the first panel who were more involved in the methodology who might want to add on to that as well. So I, I would invite them to add, but I guess maybe I'll just put the trade-off question out there in terms of salience, legitimacy, and credibility, and, and kind of tackle that one first and then and then move through them. So anybody want to look at that one? Well, I can jump in briefly just to say that I think that they're very interrelated and that um, in the Ugandan case, I did not come across any contradictions between them, but rather the, in, the taking all three into consideration in the design of the study and in the communication and dissemination process was very important, but there wasn't really a, a trade-off one against the other. Yeah, the only thing I would I think that I think with the trade I think the process to get legitimacy and credibility be quite long, and so I think if the process if there isn't a distinguished endpoint at which you need documents or the information, then I think they can be very complementary. I think where you start getting into trade offs is is where we had we had a very sharp decision point, and therefore then you have to strategically think of how do we do we maintain salience and and sacrifice credibility and legitimacy. Or, or the other way around. And so I really think it depends on what your key decision-making point is. If it's open-ended, there, there's probably not a lot of a trade-off. Yeah, I would just add that it, it really also depends on the context. You know, um, just talking about the case uh, in Senegal, I think, you know, it's, uh, it requires also patience sometimes, you know, because it's, uh, it takes time um, to establish a good rapport with the, with the institution. First of all, I mean, they have to, they check you out too. I mean, they try to, you know, to understand what you're trying to do, and so it's 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 a long process, um, um, and uh, also you know in, in, when you try to build capacity, you know, which is also uh, an important dim dimension, you have also to understand not only the the, the capacity within the overall institution, but also um, inside the institution. Also, you have to to, to 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 get you know the best researchers, and so it's 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 a, it's really a, um, a time-consuming process. But I think you know in the case of Senegal, it was a we were lucky to to, to have uh, CSE and uh, ISRA, um, you know, and they all also were on board also in terms of the the, the the fact that you know this is something that was needed you know, right now. Great, thank you very much. Um, we had some kind of communications related question, one talking about how you know you communicate uncertainty to decision makers, and another in terms of I thought stakeholder prioritization and distilling of information and, and how you engage those various audiences and um, just some reflections on, on those two on those two broader points on communications overall would be great from the from the panel. Well I can start on the uncertainty. I mean I think with the with the maps it's a huge trade off. I mean we worked with Alex to really understand the uncertainty. And so Alex, like Alex mentioned, he produced several different maps using different analytical methodologies. They did a sensitivity analysis. So we as the knowledge brokers really had a great sense of what uncertainty was under those maps. There's also ways you can plot them on the maps. The challenge is the more information you put on these maps, the more you lose the simplicity and clarity of them. And so you really have to balance that. And I think that's that's where the maps become dangerous. If if you put the maps out and you don't caveat them, and, and Alex is, is very good at that, and sometimes he undersells himself in terms of all of the issues with the maps. You really got to balance that, and I, mean, I think what you need to do is make sure that the analytical rigor is there, and then you just have to let people know this is a construct. It is one way of looking at it, um, but oftentimes those, that's to the level the decision makers want, and then you can work with them to figure out what, what levels of uncertainty they want. The, the challenge comes is once you le release the map out into the ether and it gets away from those knowledge brokers, then you're in a little more of a dangerous situation where maps can begin to be used by people for reasons they shouldn't be how to do. And I still think that's a very ongoing discussion in the world around creating these maps of, of how do we ensure that once they get out there and, and they're away from the knowledge brokers that they're still used effectively without overcomplicating them with all the, all the nuance. Thank you. Um, well, regarding uncertainty, um, I think it's a very good idea to create partnerships since the very beginning that we are working on these issues. Um, and, and the people that participate in this, in this process should be clear 
and understand that our understanding of climate risks and 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 uh, uh, how effective uh, the adaptation measures will be will be changing over time. That our uh, knowledge will be increasing uh, through time, and and this has to be clear since the very beginning. In in the case of Honduras, um, in, and in the in the in the case of the of this assessment in Honduras. What I saw is that because people really participated in the focal group discussions, they, they were uh, lots of people that were key informants, and including both within the government and uh, in, the, in the private sector and the NGOs and, and other sectors. Um, I saw how people, after when we presented the document, they really believed in what, what uh, the, the document is saying. And uh, the other thing is that when you have good partners, um, such as the uh, as with 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 key and and high level uh, technical uh, people, uh, this provides more credibility to the studies. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the private sector question. Um, I think the first thing that we need to do is to is to make the private sector aware of this climate change. Uh, very often, this topic is being seen as a natural resources problem, uh, not as an economical and a social one. So the first thing that we need to do, I think, is to uh, speak clearly uh, about the issue and, and to keep it simple, to avoid using these very complicated words that sometimes us, the climate change people, use. And, and once someone told me that nobody was understanding what I was saying because I was talking about resilience and, and, and I was talking about adaptation, mitigation, no regret, low regret, win-win actions. So what is that? So we need to, to keep it simple so people, especially private sector, can understand uh, what we are talking about. Uh, the second thing is that once that they, they uh, understand this, the, the, the problem, they will start to demand uh, information, and, and this is something that has happened not only in Honduras, but in other countries. They are interested in knowing what, what are the climate projections, where they can find information about precipitation projections, for example, or temperature. And, and as, uh, as uh, John was saying, in the case of Honduras, melon and watermelon producers are, are now demanding this information. Um, and uh, and, and the, the third thing that I would recommend is to take the opportunities. In the, case, in, the, in the case of Honduras, um, this study was released almost at the same time that we were in the middle of the drought. And so this created a, a very good uh, moment uh, for, for getting people's attention to, to the study and to think a little bit more about uh, the problem, not only seeing the, 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 the today's problem, but to see that this problem will be in an evolution and will become worse and worse over time. One thing I want to add to this uh, is um, in terms of um, you know how to communicate. I mean, it has to do with um, I mean two things. One has to do with uh, one thing has to do with uh, um, who communicates also, um, and uh, and how to communicate. Um, in um, and that's where also the issue of credibility you know comes on and legitimacy because. Uh, just to give you an example, I, one thing that I, uh, some of the stakeholders in, in the field, I mean, in local community members, you know, village chiefs and uh, women's representatives liked was to, to, to talk in terms of, uh, to look at the forecast in terms of something that they already knew in the past, you know, like linking uh, the unknown future to, to some kind of known elements in the past. That was very interesting, you know, in Senegal when we tried to look at uh, uh, to make you know people just to 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 the feedback we were able to get, and that was something very 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 interesting, you know. So the the idea of uh, uh, being you know clear, having a very clear message, but also being able to um, uh, to to have credible people who actually would come and communicate the information to the uh, you know to the people is is very very important because uh, let's face it, the reality also is that sometimes you have. Uh, different interests and different, you know, so we you know we, we uh, there are uh, issues of conflict sometimes that happens, you know. So it's very important to be credible to the communities and you know have somebody who can, um, you know, be uh, uh, 
known in the community or in the country for being really there for the people and uh, trying you know to do something positive about you know uh, increasing resilience or, or getting people out of uh, food insecurity and things like that thanks i'd like to, I'd like to also ad address um the the private sector question um in my presentation i focused primarily on the ways in which uptake uh was being taken forward on a on a governmental and, and donor level um but uh, one of the other important um, focuses of the, feed, the whole USAID Feed the Future activity is strengthening uh, private sector relationships, strengthening uh, market linkages between, between farmers, traders, exporters, um, as well as the input supply chain. And so part of our effort then is to uh, really look at how the climate change projections um, are expected to impact at, in, in the agricultural sector, on the private sector, players and their relationships up and down the value chain. Uh, and this then uh, is, is feeding the demand for uh, agricultural research to be able to, to present climate smart adaptation uh, technologies and recommendations that can be um, taken down to the farmers through the various uh, value chain actors. And so the traders themselves and their agents and their, who link um, the, the traders with the, the producers are a very important channel uh, in the long run for the dissemination, not only of climate information, but of uh, adaptation response options. So that's, an, that's a really important future direction for uh, the involvement of the vulnerability assessment results. Um, I'd also like to comment briefly on the gender issue. Um, there are so many nuances and layers in the, uh, in the analysis and the data collection that we have not talked about. Uh, and the whole um, analysis of gender impacts is an important part of the findings that came out of the Uganda study. Um, there was a very clear uh, indications that um, adaptive capacity was lower and vulnerability was higher for female-headed households, households with fewer adults in the in the um, uh, in the household mix, uh, with higher dependency ratios, etc. And all of this uh, really played an important role in the in the analysis and looking at the options that are available to different types of livelihood groups, different types of categories of, of key stakeholders. Um, and so there's a lot more that can be said about that and a lot more information that's available in the various publications. Great. That, that was, thank you very much. Um, one, one more trailing question out of there, very Senegal specific in terms of Mali, uh, Senegal, Meteo, and, and their engagement and other key stakeholders, is there something that could have changed um, in Senegal that, that would have improved that process, Mamadou, or? Yeah, I think, you know, if, uh, as I said, mentioned, you know, earlier that uh, uh, some of the stakeholders we partnered with are, you know, planning to take this to the next level and uh, um, in that, you know, they also thinking about, you know, uh, they, they're talking with the meteorological services, so hopefully you know, next time they will be involved. It won't be only the ones that we work with, be also other institutions involved in the process. Um, but I know the project tried hard, you know, to get, you know, all the uh, relevant uh, institutions, you know, on board, uh, but it just did not work out, you know, this time. Uh, hopefully next time it will. Great. I also wanted to add one comment about yeah. the issue of, um, Women's. I think it's it's a uh, in Senegal in Eastern Senegal. What what came out also very strongly was uh, that I mean there is a women talk about they, the ones that we talked to were actually hopeful in terms of being able to do something um, with the negative impact of climate change uh, in terms of resiliency and uh, for instance you know uh, gardening you know uh, being able to. Uh, develop some kind of water harvesting techniques, you know, with a little bit of water that comes, you know, in and uh, uh, having like some uh, uh, new crops, you know, that they are trying to uh, actually to, to grow. I mean, these are interesting uh, things. 
Um, but the issue has to do, I mean, they have two problems. One has to do with, uh, with land, which is something that they mentioned, you know. So we need also to think about how to improve uh, land governance, how to make land available to, to women, and that's, that's very important. The, the other issue linked to that also is uh, the issue of water, I mean, how to, because irrigation is, is, uh, could be an alternative in terms of actually uh, the land is, is there. I mean, it is good. It can grow a lot of kind of things, but getting the water from the ground, you know, to the, to the land is an issue. So I think there are some, some things that are, might not be too costly that can be done, I mean, that can significantly improve the living conditions of women in those areas, but they might also involve some kind of um, tough decisions in terms of policies, like, you know, it might require some kind of changes in the, in the land tenure system and things like that. And that's where also I think, you know, our advocates like USAID and others can push for, you know, some kind of changes because some of the issues are structural issues and you also need to have policy changes at a certain level to make, you know, uh, access to land more available to more women in, in some places. Yeah, I just want to add one quick point to that. Sorry, Leif, be real quick. Um, we actually had a, a study done in Mali that looked at how gender affects this stuff. And what we found is that you can't just look at gender. I mean, there was actually big differences between old women and young women and old men and young men. And so it's, I think it becomes a lot more nuanced than this. And so I think that, and I think Rita's right, that I think if you look back and through a lot of the, the research that we've produced, you really begin to see that a lot of this stuff hits at the high level, but you really need to get down into the community and understand the dynamics between the different families, the different individuals, the different households, to truly understand how vulnerability differentiates between itself. Um, and so I think it's a great question, but there's a lot of nuance there. Yeah, once again, I'll plug the reports. There's a lot of information, and then everything is going to be available. All the data sets are also available, so you can, you can definitely get into that analysis. I think we'll Take some uh, questions from, from the online community, please. Um, we have about three questions. Um, I'll ask the first one, and then my colleague will ask the second two. The first one's kind of a consolidated question that came out of the side discussion that's been going on on the internet back here, having to do with mainstreaming climate change. Um, you've talked this, this morning about some of the characteristics of a CCVA that are needed to improve uptake, credibility, salience, and legitimacy. But we wonder if you could talk a little bit about what happens next, the next step. For instance, how the messaging for mainstreaming might differ from one group to another or from one country to another. We wonder if you could talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of your experiences working with USAID and governments to take the findings from the assessments and mainstream them into policy programs and actions. And related to that, have, there, have you seen any changes in actual political will that has occurred as a result of these assessments? These next two questions are a lot more specific than that. The first one comes from Patrice Hakizimana from USAID Rwanda. Are CCVAs providing climate change adaptive solutions that are understandable and affordable at the district level? And this next question comes from Sid Hamilton, an ORISE fellow at Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee. How can cloud forests be conserved in the face of climate change? Is there a negative ecological feedback to be tapped into as a solution? Uh, that was great. Um, three, three very <coughs> clear questions. Um, Isak, do you want to take the specific cloud forest question? Yeah, thank you. Um, for sure. Uh, uh, well, we won't change the the these projections on about temperature and precipitation, and and of course it will have a, this will have an impact on on any ecosystem. It's not just cloud forest. This this is just like the the, the ecosystem that we are. Uh, uh, that we care a little bit more uh, because they are sources for, for water. Um, I guess that what we have to do uh, regarding this, this type of forest is to, to restore what already has been under degradation and, and to uh, create a, a stronger framework, a governance that uh, could protect better uh, what what the, the cloud forests that we have uh, already in, 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 in the country. This is this is one solution for for uh, the conservation of, of the cloud forest and, and, and this type of forest. Um, but this has to be linked with other investments on water management. Uh, we need to increase 
the capacity of the society to manage water, to, to, to distribute it, to, um, to conserve water, to, to storage it, and, and then to, to uh, um, train people on how to use it efficiency in the agricultural sector, uh, industrial sector, and of course, at the domestic level. Um, I think conservation is, is, is a very important part of the solution. However, we need to see the, the water management as a whole uh, if we really want to, to have a, an impact on the resilience of the population. Great, thank you. Um, in, in terms of the messaging of findings and changing of political will, I mean, we, we've touched on that in, in a little bit. Um, yes. Um, I, well, in, in our case, once again, uh, the, the, the study was 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 carried out at the right time um, because because this is as I said before this is an Enso or an Nino year and and we already were having a lot of problems regarding uh, the lack of precipitation and uh, enormous economical losses in the agricultural sector so that helped to to to, to uh, provide more attention to to the findings um, what I would say is that once again it is very important to create partnerships, to see, uh, in, in our case, we cannot work without the government and with the government of Honduras. And, and what we have seen is that the government is very interested on learning about all these new findings. And even when, when uncertainty is there, uh, they are uh, trying to, to, to promote this um, adaptive management in which we are trying to promote through the, this uh, Alliance for the Dry Corridor measures that make sense uh, on, 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 on what is going on today, uh, but for sure will allow us to, uh, for incremental change in the future. Um, so uh, el, the, the, the fact that uh, all these um, stakeholders, the private sector, the NGOs and the, and, and the government are being affected uh, by, by, by floodings and droughts in the case of Honduras, uh, this help us to, to have a better um, environment to promote uh, adaptive capacity. In, in, yeah. And we understand adaptive capacity as first to make information available and to make people aware of what is going on. Second, to create these this, uh, social platforms such as the Dry Corridor Alliance or the, or the Agricultural Committee on Climate Change. And third, to create the regulations and, 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 and the guidelines that will help us to uh, promote then uh, the adoption of adaptation measures in the field. Yeah, that, great, thank you. We're, we're running, running a little bit uh, on time here. And um, you know, Rita, if you want to comment, and then Mamadou, just maybe if you could briefly talk about the local experience, because I know you really got into that, and that may be able to help our colleagues in USAID Rwanda you know, reflect a little. Okay. Um, I think the how to change the political will is an important question, and I, it has to happen at two levels. One would be from the bottom and also from the top. When I say the top, it means from USAID you know, at the toppest level possible uh, with the government, but also, but I believe also more change happening at the level of the communities. Because um, when, when we, uh, I enjoyed really spending the time, you know, nights and days in the field talking to the women and, and farmers and and I, I see some kind of people saying, well, business is no longer going to be the same like before. We are going to be, you know, we want to accept certain things. We want things to happen, you know, and things like that. So it's, it's a, there is a need really to get down to that level and share that information with those people. We did some of it, but I think more can be done, you know, in terms of, I mean, the idea was even to say, to translate, you know, the finding into local languages, you know, and, and when we mentioned Baba Mal, the idea was also we talked about getting some, organizing some kind of festival to look at success stories in dealing with negative impact of climate change in eastern Senegal, where we have interesting cases where people are using solar energy to irrigate fields and stuff like that. So this, that I think that kind of uh, action needs to happen at that level, combined with some some uh, action also at the top. Those two things would lead to something very positive, and maybe there is also a need some kind of debates at the national level where you have different stakeholders being involved, you know, private uh, uh, civil society, but also you know the private sector all together, and people can come up with. I think the the debate has to get down to the level of the people, 
and, uh, and that, that, that's very important. The other thing is also to develop some kind of effective partnership. People talk about partnership, but I think it's more about the quality of the partnership. Who are those people getting together? Um, and and, and who, who have some kind of shared vision in terms of, of doing something very positive. So I think that's, that's also something that I, 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 uh, I would like to, 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 to emphasize. And then third, really, you see, when I look at those areas, I would like to stress again the, the important thing, uh, role of women in, in those places. I mean, what they are doing right now. I mean, they, it's, it's really very, um, uh, more of them are there. They do more work, and they, they are involved in all kinds of things. And they, they, the hope is within them. I mean, they do uh, microcredit. They do, uh, you know, gardening in those areas. So I think, you know, the, we have to be looking at... Uh, getting down to that level and being able to communicate the information um, at, at the grassroots level. I'm gonna stop there. Okay, well, I, I think, I'm, I know um, our, our last speaker is here and um, I think we're gonna need to conclude this panel, but I really do appreciate all four of you and taking the time to answer those questions and your presentations, doing such a wonderful job. Thank you very much. And um, the panelists will very much be available um, afterwards, so please feel free to engage them um, during lunch. So just um, to, to wrap things up, um, we're, we're going to have a little bit of forward uh, thinking perspective. And to, to help us through that process, the chief scientist for the Bureau of Food Security, um, Robert Bertram, is, is going to come up to the stage. He, um, he's been with USAID for uh, 20 years. And he comes from a plant breeding genetics background. His bio is available for all of you to read. Um, his career has um, dealt with building stronger research ties with US community and, and others elsewhere. So please, the floor is yours. We look forward to your insights. Thank you, and uh, good morning, or I guess good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks especially to Tegan and the organizers for inviting me to share a few perspectives from the Bureau of Food Security. Um, you're probably aware that in the US government, our global food security agenda is called Feed the Future. Uh, since it was established about five years ago, the central focus, or one, three, it has had three cross-cutting objectives. One of them has been uh, climate change, but I would put to you that that has been primarily focused on adaptation. Now, actually, I think that underscores the relevance of today's discussion in terms of understanding just what our vulnerabilities may be, because those probably most acutely impact adaptation before they get maybe to issues around mitigation, which have more of a, a global uh, uh, aspect to them. Um, I think climate's been perhaps most visible in the research portfolio, which was created to look ahead. And we knew this was going to be, and already is, frankly, one of the great challenges we're facing. Um, the, the, the positive thing about this in the context of food security and R&D to take us that direction is that this is not a distraction from today's problems. Most of the communities that Feed the Future is working with, especially in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, are already climate challenged or weather challenged, whatever you would like to call it. I mean, they're often we're dealing with smallholder farming in, in uncertain climates, droughts occur with uh, a, a regularity, uh, other kinds of weather shocks occur. So while these aspects may worsen over time, uh, they're already there, and so figuring out how we deal with them now as, as, is a first step towards taking us towards the future. This is true in most cases. I think in a, a, a few cases we've, we've gone beyond that, I would say, especially in the area of heat tolerance. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, one of the other challenges we face, frankly, is that if we, as we look at climate models, and I know you all know far more about this than I, they are clearest poleward, and then as you approach the equator, the clarity becomes less in terms of what's going to actually happen on, with, say, precipitation patterns. And, and I, I gather there's been some discussion of this this morning. Um, but that's something where we will be continuing to seek advice about, you know, just where is, what is the science telling us? What, what, what's our best estimate of the impacts we'll be facing? Um, 
we uh, are already, as I said, dealing with climate, but also climate change. Uh, South Asia and the Indo-Gangetic Plains is one of the key focus areas in terms of global food security and feed the future. The onset of early heat during the, in, at the, in say the March, February, March period is already having huge effects, uh, just different from 20, 30 years ago. So uh, we're seeing it there. We also know that higher nighttime temperatures are threatening a rice fertilization and the, and the harvest of rice. Uh, so, so we're already, in a sense, uh, uh, dealing with climate and weather as a central aspect of how we're trying to achieve food security, productivity growth, and nutrition improvements as well. So I think the key then is to figure how, what are, how can we build on the steps we're already taking, and that's where the, the work you're doing, I think, really comes into to the discussion. Um, we have, uh, as I said, focused a lot on heat tolerance because that does seem to be one area where there was actually a lack of leadership. A lot of other investments in drought tolerance, some in salinity tolerance, but heat tolerance, not as much. So we've been very happy to uh, partner with a whole range of partners in the university community uh, on heat tolerance, but also on drought. Uh, we have new innovation labs, we call them, Feed the Future Innovation Labs, working on climate resilience in chickpea, poultry, cowpea, millet, sorghum, wheat. Small-scale irrigation is a major thrust for us. I'll say more about that. And I was glad to hear the discussion of water just now. And uh, our overall theory of change for smallholders is something we call sustainable intensification, which is all about trying to manage risks of all kinds but to do it in a way that builds resilience, much of which depends on managing resources efficiently and particularly trying to enhance the amount of biomass in the system. Uh, so there's a, a whole sort of a climate, both a resilience and potentially a mitigation approach there. We're also working with the private sector, uh, companies like Ceres, DuPont Pioneer, Arcadia Bioscience, Monsanto, and others to leverage the cutting edge science that has drought tolerant maize on the market in the US this year. Farmers can purchase drought tolerant maize. We're trying to leverage that same science into the, the kinds of technologies that are available to smallholders in the developing world. Now, um, I mentioned sustainable intensification as, as how we're trying to put everything together. And it's not just technology. Yes, it's biomass. Yes, it's nitrogen fixing legumes. It's climate resilient cereals, but it's also about resource management and efficiency, small scale irrigation, uh, soil cover, uh, uh, and a whole uh, aspect, array of, of risk reduction efforts around information, the consideration of things like index insurance against drought. So all of this is to try to build resilience now, but hopefully it's a a good basis then on which to go forward into the future. And that's why the, 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 the dialogue and the analyses that you all are doing can, can help us in terms of uh, considering that going forward. On the matter of water, and particularly in Africa, the uh, uh, situation with the, the hydrology that we're seeing in the last couple of years is really quite promising for sustainable uh, expansion of irrigation. The key, like everything else we're trying to do, is how do you put small holders at the center of that? We're not talking about big irrigation schemes the way we've seen in South Asia, but we would love to see small holders. Now, the, the problem then uh, that we run into with, uh, with uh, that is that uh, you are also talking about increasing carbon footprint. So this is why the recent advent of the Climate Smart uh, Agriculture, the Global Alliance that was just launched last month in New York, the idea there is often around the triple win. Everybody, that's the increasing productivity and hopefully profits, increasing uh, uh, adaptation but also mitigation. So we know that we have some opportunities to do that and we will pursue them. We know about farmer managed forest regeneration in the Sahel evergreen agriculture in parts of southern and eastern Africa, western Africa, uh, deep, uh, more uh, efficient handling of fertilizer. But um, 
we also know that in many cases, if we're going to achieve our objectives around poverty and undernutrition, we're going to have to settle for a double win. Now, there's a silver lining. Many things we're going to do to increase adaptation also increase mitigation. I mean, they, they, act, they involve carbon and carbon storage on farm and soil fertility and, and getting more organic matter into the soil, getting more perennials into systems. So there is a, there is a plus side and what we can look forward to is increasing uh, the, uh, the, 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 reducing the greenhouse gas footprint per unit of productivity. And we know in South Asia, for example, this is work coming from our partners in CCAFs and, and elsewhere in the CGIR, we can get yields while reducing energy 46%, the energy use, reducing irrigation just by switching sometimes from rice to maize, which enjoys a strong market, 71% savings on water. And we can get real profitability increases because partly out of productivity growth, but partly out of saving energy and saving inputs and using them more wisely. So the whole conservation agriculture agenda, the diversification that goes along with that, precision agriculture, that we're gonna go forward with that. And, 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 and again, the better we can understand what lies ahead, and I know it's not easy to predict with certainty, but the vectors matter. Right? I mean, this is not, we're, we can't be precise when we're talking 10, 20, 30 years out, but vectors matter. So I, I, I encourage you to help us think through uh, uh, that uh, approach and how we can best inform our, uh, our efforts to build uh, the, the things we're on the hook for, which are poverty reduction and nutrition in a world that's going to be increasingly challenged, challenged by climate. Finally, um, I think we don't want to wait before we start showing that we can be responsive to the climate challenge. And Administrator Shaw, for those who have dealt with him, know that he has, we don't want to wait just about everywhere when he talks about whether it's health, agriculture, environment, I'm sure it's the same. It's like, what can we, what have you got for me now, today? So we are uh, really pushing hard for uh, to scale up technologies like climate resilient maize. But there's a caveat. We have a new emerging disease in East Africa, very serious, maize lethal necrosis. So we, the point here is, yes, we can bring in the improved climate resilience, the heat tolerance, the drought tolerance, the low nitrogen tolerance, but we still have to have the other factors that people care about, whether it's quality or in this case, disease resistance. Uh, drought and flood tolerant rice, going forward with that in both Asia and, uh, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Wheat, uh, heat tolerant wheat, uh, we're, we're working hard to anticipate both the diseases we face now, but also some that may emerge in the future. Uh, there are some like potato late blight and bacterial wilt of various crops that worsen with higher temperatures. So we have to think about you know, what, what, what will what will uh, pests rising up in East Africa going to higher and higher altitudes, what will that mean? It's a huge issue in agriculture, it's a huge issue in health. So uh, again, that's another case where the work you're doing is, is important. Uh, finally, I don't wanna miss that, when, particularly when we're talking about uh, the, um, the resilience and the uh, staying ahead of, of what we're going to be facing going forward, the work we do on policies and institutions. And that's across the board, but it's certainly a major thrust in food security. The ability to uh, build the capacity in countries to do the analysis, to have the data, to then use that data to make wise decisions. If, if we're serious about being country-led, that's the idea that we are following the lead of our partners, not telling them what to do. The, one of the ways we can do that is to, to, to give them the best analytical capacity that we can provide and the most re relevant uh, analytical capacity, whether that be through regional, continental, or global approaches. But I do think that that's a really essential piece of, of building the resilience that you're all looking for in the long term and that we all need to really be successful and sustainable in our efforts. So those are some thoughts uh, that I wanted to share with you all this morning. Um, I'm happy to, I don't know how much time we have or if anyone else is speaking, but I'm happy to take a question or two if, if, if that's on your agenda.
Thank you. Questions, we, we could take a, uh, a question or two if anybody has any. If not, we will have the gallery walk and, and, and you could you could take that as an opportunity as well. Hi, uh, Ken Androwska from Windrock International. Um, so this has been an incredibly rich conversation, lots of great ideas, a huge amount of work, giant data sets. So how do we move forward to decision making at the two scales that are implied? One is the national or regional scale where there might be the resources to actually deal with all this data. And the second is the scale of the farmer on the ground. Right. So how do you find a way? What have you learned from the work that you're doing so far that enables actual decisions to be made from this overwhelming massive information? Yeah. Thanks. So, so um, that's a really key thing to do, to connect the, the, the more global analysis to what's happening on the ground. Um, some interesting things we see emerging. The, the real-time weather data that's coming out of some of our investments and others uh, that uh, not only are, you know, short-term, but, you know, tell us something about when the rains are likely to arrive. There, are, there is work underway to really test and, and uh, make that kind of information available. I think the cell phone is, is a huge tool for reaching uh, local communities. And increasingly, the uh, satellite uh, uh, information we're getting can be pinpointed. It used to be that a farmer in northern Ghana, she might have to listen to the weather 85, 90, 100 kilometers away in Tamale. Didn't tell her much very useful. That's changing. So that's one example. I think the, the longer term piece is, it's almost like the, the same kinds of challenges we're facing in our own country, although perhaps with greater urgency uh, because of the, the, the poverty. So the, you know, taking into account uh, models when you're trying to make decisions about um, public investments, for example, that's why I came back to that point of institutions at the end. I really think that, that some of the decisions that are gonna draw on that big data are, are going to be at that larger level, and maybe that I think you were referring to those, uh, they do have import for what happens on the ground, uh, but I think you're absolutely right to figure that we've got to be looking for ways to connect those two things. Could be, could be a, for example, in extension systems and the kinds of information that they're getting, uh, where we have new technologies around crops that we think are going to be better adapted, what's the way we get them out? I mean, there's a whole, there's a, so much work going on on that now. We have the whole Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa working on this, and, and it, the, the social science piece of this, I don't know how many of you heard the AgriLinks presentation from Louise Sperling a few weeks ago, it's on, it's on the website, really worth, and, and Julie March, really worth listening to. Um, but I think there's gonna be ways that some of the, the larger policy objectives that are drawn out of that data can then be translated on, on the ground. But we're open for ideas, too. So. Hi, thank you. I'm Claire Nelson, Institute of Caribbean Studies. What, um, is there any plans for USAID to work in the Caribbean? The islands are very susceptible to climate change. We are at very great risk. We already um, are importing almost 99% of our food, um, and the food that we, crops that we do grow are exported for, for cash, so if nobody's paying attention to research needs of those regions because we're right. so small, how can we get attention paid to island economies? Yeah, it's, um, that's really been a dilemma for us in Feed the Future. I think in the research side, a lot of what we do is relevant across the globe, including in non-focused countries, in, including in Latin America, parts of the Caribbean, some of the, some of the traits we're working on. Um, it's a, it's, I don't know that I have a great answer for you, frankly, in terms of how to best leverage that science, but, but it can be done. Uh, of course, Haiti is one of our focus countries, so we are uh, looking at opportunities there, but that's a special case in the Caribbean, I understand that. Uh, and I think the information piece, for example, in, on our, our uh, 
environment side of the house, there is uh, what they call severe, the uh, weather service. I don't know if that was discussed today, but that is already providing real benefits to uh, Caribbean countries and countries around Central America in terms of uh, managing uh, climate risks, uh, recovery, post storms, et cetera. Uh, there are also a lot of things I think we could do in the area of um, tools around remote sensing that can be helpful. And, and those can be not just biophysical, but also looking at things like infrastructure, uh, access to markets, uh, what are the constraints that, that uh, open up uh, the, the, the question of whether or not something makes sense. One of the things that I would like to see happen going forward, and I, it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a wish at this point, is there's something we call the, uh, it's the yield gap atlas. It's the idea that, you know, we globally need to be looking at, well, and this would include the Caribbean, you know, what is the potential? We can learn a lot by looking at what happens in one environment and looking at homologs elsewhere around commodities, around weather variability, around weather trends and vectors, shocks. Uh, and, and I really hope that when we do that, we'll find a way to do it globally and, and, and so that regions like yours will, will, will uh, gain. But there might be others that could answer your question better than I, because I don't deal much with the Caribbean. But I, I do think that a lot of what we're doing is going to be relevant there. I'd, I'd, um, I'd like for us to thank, um, thank Robert for his time and catch him afterwards with that last question. We're running about 15 minutes behind.